My name's Roy, and I'm 25 years old. Since I moved out on my own, I've been very cautious. I lock all the doors, close all the windows, and make sure I have all the police and emergency numbers handy. People call me paranoid, but not everyone knows how dangerous it can be to give someone a chance to enter your home, because you don't know who you might meet. I learned this lesson the hard way 15 years ago, and every time I question whether I'm being too exaggerated, I remember what happened that night and realized that a little extra security never hurts. I was only 10 years old, and it was my first night alone. My parents were divorced, and my dad wasn't a big fan of babysitters, as he didn't trust inviting a stranger into your home to watch your child. I usually live with my mother, but she had to go on a business trip, and although my father spent every weekend with me, on weekdays, I didn't know anything about his life. My mother forced my dad to take care of me for that week, and my dad told her that he was taking a vacation to be with me, but he lied. He had already taken a leave a month ago to go to another country with his new girlfriend, and even though he didn't tell me, I saw his messages with her, and I knew it was true. Without the vacation, my dad got engaged to my mom, and when he talked to me, he told me that he had to work and that I could take care of myself. I was already old, and he knew that I was very responsible. He promised me not to say anything to my mom, and I agreed. I wanted to be alone too. It was my chance to prove to the world that I could take care of myself. When he left for work, my dad locked all the doors and left me the keys. He also left me all the emergency numbers close by, with his on top of everything if anything should happen. He also left me prepared food that I only had to reheat, and lots of treats to eat only after dinner. He told me that to make sure I did everything, there were cameras all over the house and that he would watch me at all times, but I knew that was a lie. Otherwise, he would have told me before or shown them to me. After all this, my father grabbed all the stuff and left, leaving me alone in his apartment. The moment he left, I was running to open the candy and stuffed all of it in my mouth without a second thought. I knew that after dinner, I would want to eat more, so I saved a few for later and went to watch TV. After a few minutes, I fell asleep with my belly full of treats and the TV on. I was dreaming about my pets at my mom's house until suddenly a loud noise woke me up. The doorbell was ringing incessantly as if someone who knew the place wasn't empty had been ringing for a while. I was terrified that I hadn't slept all day and the doorbell ringer was my angry dad. But when I saw the time, I realized that it would still be a long time before he arrived. I put on my flip-flops and approached the door. On the other side was a woman. She looked familiar, but I couldn't try to remember who she was. I asked her what she wanted, and she told me she was the neighbor my dad sent to take care of me. I told her that my dad had left me alone, but she said he changed his mind on the way downstairs and sent her to make sure everything was okay for a few minutes. I wasn't sure if I believed her, but within seconds she said, Come on, open up, Roy, or your dad'll get mad. This woman looked very familiar. She knew my father was working and knew my name, so I believed her and opened up. As she walked in, she thanked me with a strange smile and started asking me if I had done my homework, to which I replied surprisingly that I was on vacation since it was the middle of January. She just laughed, ignored me, and told me to watch TV and hurried into my father's room. I saw out of the corner of my eye what she was doing, and she was rummaging through everything as if she was looking for something. I asked what she was doing, and she told me that my father had told her to get his money from him and to give it to her because she wanted to buy a surprise for his favorite son. At that moment, I didn't notice how strange it was that my father didn't know where his own money was, and I just got excited about the surprise I was going to get. After a few minutes, the girl violently broke the drawer of a closed cabinet and took out a pile of money, to which she reacted by <laughs> laughing frantically. She stuffed everything into a bag and was leaving, but I stopped her and asked her to warm up my food before she left. At first, she just looked at me angrily, but then she gave me a big smile and said she'd be happy to warm up my food. Suddenly, she rushed over to me and hugged and squeezed me violently. I started to cry in desperation, but she paid no attention. Just pulled me over to the kitchen chair and told me to stay still or she would hurt me. Terrified, I obeyed. 
The girl tied me to the chair with a rope she had found while going through my father's things and started boiling water. She would probably make me the noodles my dad had on top of the fridge. I told her I wasn't hungry anymore, but she ignored me. After a few minutes, she asked if I was thirsty and wanted some water, to which I told her I'd prefer some orange juice. I asked her if she could untie me since the ropes were tight, and again, she did not answer me. I wanted to ask her if she would serve me juice, my thoughts were interrupted by an indescribable sensation of pain. The girl was pouring all the hot boiling water slowly on my head. She was dripping it slowly and the water was running all over my face and body. I screamed desperately and tried to free myself, but there was no solution. I felt my face starting to melt and my vision beginning to blur. The girl started to run the hot water all over the rest of my body, ensuring that none of my parts were dry while she laughed non-stop. When she ran out of the water, I was still screaming, to which she reacted by slapping me hard across the face as she continued to laugh. Almost without understanding anything, I heard banging on the door and voices asking me if everything was all right. The woman went to open the door and worriedly told the neighbors that I had an accident and needed help. As the neighbors came in to see me, she ran out of the house in desperation, taking all my father's money with her. The neighbors who came to help me saw me and screamed in surprise when they saw my condition, and they untied me and desperately called the ambulance. I was never able to recover from what happened. I received permanent wounds and marks all over my body and could not leave the hospital for a long time. Eventually, I found out that that woman was my dad's ex-girlfriend, with whom he had gone on a vacation a month before, but they had a very violent fight. The girl looked familiar to me because some of the pictures I saw of her when I was checking my father's cell phone. And I also remembered how I had seen them arguing loudly in chat rooms and she constantly threatened to hurt me, but my father never took her seriously. After the hospital, I didn't see my father for years, not because he didn't want to see me, but because my mother denied him until I was of age and could decide independently. My father didn't try to take any legal action against her as he felt very guilty about what happened and felt that maybe he deserved it. Today my relationship with him has improved a little, but I never go into his apartment again because every time I see him from a distance, the marks that are permanently left on my skin start to burn again. My name is Eileen, and although very few people have believed me since I was a little girl, my dream was to work at Hooters. This was always a source of ridicule at school because when they asked all my classmates, they wanted to be doctors, veterinarians, drive airplanes, or work as lawyers. All of those jobs seemed incredibly dull to me. At Hooters, on the other hand, all the girls seemed to always have fun. Every time we went there, they were all smiling, talking to each other and the customers, active and happy. I was convinced that as soon as I turned 18, I would work there. But little did I know, the nightmare was coming to me when I did. A week after I turned 18, and went to Hooters to drop off my resume. I had no work experience, but I tried to look as enthusiastic and happy as possible. The manager seemed like a nice guy, treated me very well, and told me how Hooters was first a family and then a job. After the interview, he said that he would call me during the day after evaluating the other candidates. But when he saw me nervous, he winked at me and told me to stay calm and that the job was mine. When I left, I was jumping for joy in the street. I was so happy that people probably thought I had won the lottery. There would be more than one person who would be surprised if they knew that I only had an interview at Hooters. When I got home, I remember being glued to my cell phone, waiting for the call. Luckily, I didn't have to wait that long because a few hours later, I was already listening to the voice of the kind manager who had served me, telling me to come to try me the next day in the morning before the store opened. I told my parents, almost crying from happiness. I knew that sooner or later, I would end up at Hooters, and luckily, it was sooner rather than later. That night, I could barely sleep. As soon as it was morning, I woke up sleep-deprived, took a long bath to relax, and after a huge breakfast that I refused to eat to look skinny, I went to Hooters. My father interrupted me, and told me not to let anyone take advantage of me, to which I laughed at him and told him to calm down 
as there is a lot of security and everyone who works at Hooters looks out for the health of their employees. My father didn't seem convinced, but he hugged me and I left. I arrived much earlier than I agreed, but my manager was already waiting for me. I knew that Hooters wasn't even open at that time, but even so, there were already employees working. Upon seeing me, the young manager greeted me with a hug and told me that he welcomed me, and even though I was on a trial run, I was well on my way, and the job was almost mine. The man introduced me to the rest of the employees, and they all greeted me very nicely. The girls had that happiness and friendliness that I saw so much when I was a kid, so I tried to be as much like them as possible. After that, my manager left me with an employee who greeted me and told me that she was the one who had been there the longest. She showed me how to treat customers and all the strategies at Hooters to keep them ordering. At first, I was a little uncomfortable, but I was already 18 years old. I was aware of what Hooters was all about and I went to work there willingly, knowing what I was going to find. After a few hours of training, the girl told me I was ready to serve some customers, so my manager sent me to my first table. The man was middle-aged and was with his friends, also his age. I went over to take his order, and the man spoke for everyone ordering a burger, fries, and beer. I admit that this man did not make me feel as good as I expected. I could feel him looking at me constantly and I even received some sexual comments from him. But I put up with it and never wiped the smile off my face. When I returned to my manager, who was nearby listening to everything, he congratulated me and quickly sent me to another table since the man had just sat down. The man had a strange smell, like liquor. He asked me to sit with him, and I had no choice but to do so. As the man spoke to me, I could feel a strange, rotten breath coming out of his mouth as he came closer and closer to me. He tried to touch my leg, so I violently slapped his hand away and left the table. My manager's reaction surprised me. He was angry with me, telling me that no matter what, I couldn't leave that way, as it would scare the customer away. The manager made me go back to that table to apologize, while the man, with a big smile, accepted my apology as long as it didn't happen again. I was a little angry, but this was the job I had wanted for so long, so I was going to put up with whatever it took until I got used to it. I went back to serving this man, putting up with his rude comments and some leg rubbing. I wanted him to go away, but he not only took forever to eat, but he asked for small meals at a time. To make matters worse, the kitchen was taking forever and the man wanted me exclusively for himself, which my manager forced me to accept by way of apology. While I was with him, the man received a call and ran out of the store to answer it. He left his things in the store, so I knew that my torment with him was not over. But at least I could rest for a moment. I approached the kitchen to tell my manager how much I had endured and show him how much I had improved about the wrong time I had had before. But before I opened the door, I heard his voice talking to the girl who had trained me. They were both laughing loudly. I quickly realized that they were talking about me since the manager mentioned me as the new girl and not Eileen. I stayed a while longer, listening to decipher if they were talking about how I was doing and what I heard surprised me so much that I almost fell to the floor. The man was saying that the idea of hiring new girls to put up with the worst clients had worked that now his boss would be happy that we didn't write off any clients. They both laughed at me for putting up with as much as I put up with from that man and revealed that after a few days, they planned to say that I mistreated the clients, fired me, and put another new girl in training. At that moment, I was furious, and I felt that this man had taken advantage of all my happiness and the desire I had to work with them and had used me as no one else had ever done before. I came out of my hiding place dizzy and found the man again, shouting furiously at me from his table to go and serve him again. The man was calling me names and insulting me nonstop. I almost started to cry, but a sense of anger overcame my body and drove me to his table. As soon as I was next to him, I sat down 
and he started talking to me in a low voice, telling me not to leave again, that as long as he was taking care of me, I was his property. The man began to run his hand down my leg, to which I responded by grabbing his knife and plunging it violently into his crotch. Blood spurted out, and the man stopped and began to run desperately around the room, clutching himself until he bumped into a table and fell. His desperate screams made my manager come out and ask what was going on. When I saw him, my first impulse was to throw the knife at him, but I missed, and it went inches from his throat. Still furious, I yelled at him to quit and left the premises. No one tried to stop me. People just approached the wounded man while my manager just froze and watched me go. A few minutes later, the police showed up at my house and took me away. I accepted and left without resistance. Luckily, the man survived my attack, and although he pressed charges, my parents had outstanding lawyers, and I spent very little time in prison. Shortly after that, I found out that the store had closed because of what had happened. When I got out of jail, I decided to go to medical school, and I also vowed never to set foot in a Hooters again. Everybody goes through tough breakups. It's inevitable and a necessary part of growing up. This is something my father always told me, as he offered consolation during my many heartbreaks in my adolescence. But remember, each heartbreak will draw you closer to the one, he'd say, emphasizing the last two words. I lived by these words, finding optimism and heartache and keeping my head high despite emotional despair. Eventually, after years of viewing broken relationships through rose-colored glasses, I met Stacy. For a few years in my 20s, I truly believed Stacy was the one. We met in college, dated for years, and fell in love. She checked all of the boxes. She was sweet, smart, kind, and most importantly, she loved me. But ultimately, it ended though not like any of my previous relationships. Everything began to unravel five weeks ago. Emotionally, Stacy and I had been navigating rough waters. We both felt that the other had changed into an unrecognizable shell of their former self. We couldn't communicate, and our relationship deteriorated. I decided to call it. We aren't working out, I said to her one Saturday afternoon while sitting in a booth at our local diner. Her eyes stared down at the table, glassy with tears. I think we should end things now, while we're still on civil terms, rather than postpone it and hate each other. She continued to stare down for a few minutes. The tension in the booth grew. She finally looked up. Three years? Johnny, she said in a whisper. I've given you three years for this. She gestures at the restaurant around us. To end it in a fucking diner? I'm sorry, I said. I don't know what else to say. I got out of the booth and dropped a $20 bill on the table. Still looking down, she whispered, you will be. What? I asked sharply. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? She looked up, gave me a weak smile, gathered her things and headed for the door. It's nothing, she said. I'll just need some time. But as is always the case, things didn't break smoothly. For the next few weeks, Stacy made unexpected appearances throughout my daily routines. During a stop at the supermarket, I spotted her familiar face three aisles away, staring at me through dark sunglasses. Eating dinner with my coworkers, I noticed her sitting at the bar, glancing over to my table every few seconds. Every night I'd spot her old Ford car parked across the street. I hoped her interest in me would flicker away, but when the stalking intensified, I decided to stop it. A cold morning a week later, I entered my coffee shop for my daily routine. The barista greeted me cheerfully. Good morning, Johnny, she waved. 
grinning wildly. Here you go, the usual. She handed me my personalized Americano drink. I stared blankly, since I hadn't ordered. Courtesy of Miss Stacy, she beamed. I have to say, you two make such a cute couple. Her pitch rose in delight. She nodded her head towards the back of the shop, where Stacy sat, grinning. She shot me a quick wave. Listen, Monica, I began. I'm not sure if you've heard, but Stacy and I are engaged. A voice finished for me, behind me. Stacy wiggled her hand to Monica. A diamond ring glittered on her finger. Oh. My. God. Screamed the barista. Stacy joined with a high-pitched yelp. Why didn't you tell me? Congratulations to you guys. I've always thought of you two. I cut her off, grabbed Stacy's arm, and dragged Stacy out the door. What the fuck, Stacy? I scolded. What the fuck are you doing? I know you didn't want to break up, but this? This? What the fuck? Stacy began to weep loudly. Eyes glared at me suspiciously. Stop, I whispered sharply. Stop. Like a switch, her crying stopped. See, she said smiling in a calm and soothing voice. See what I can do? Everyone will always believe the girl. I stared blankly disbelieving. Let me put it in simple terms. She began in the same eerie voice. You are not breaking up with me. Got it? If you do, let's say there will be a lot of trouble for you. She winked. You're fucking crazy, I said in a hoarse voice. Maybe, she shrugged indifferently. But you're stuck with me, so don't suggest being apart again. Got it? She planted a kiss on my unmoving cheek and strolled down the street. See you, babe, she winked at me over her shoulder. That night, I sent Stacy a series of harsh texts demanding she leaves alone. I told her we were over. I told her I didn't want to see her. And I ended with a threat. If she didn't stop her stalking, I would file a restraining order. I didn't see Stacy for a week and a half. Yesterday evening, I arrived at my apartment and noticed my door was slightly ajar. Adrenaline pumping, I pulled my phone and dialed the police. I poked my head inside. Hello? I yelled. Is anyone here? If you are, identify yourself or I will call the police. No response came. This is your last warning. I screamed, trying to sound brave. I will call the police. In the distance, I heard a voice. It sounded familiar. It sounded like Alex Trebek. I locked my phone and entered my apartment. The bright television screen broke the living room's darkness. What phenomenon occurs? Alex began. Often referred to as the Northern Lights. On the couch, Stacy sat with a bowl of popcorn on her lap. Aurora Borealis, she chirped through a full mouth. I stood at the entrance to my living room, staring, immobilized with fear. My keys dropped, causing a loud clang. Stacy's head turned. Hey, babe, glad you're home. I know, I know, she began apologetically. I know you always want me to wait for you to watch our Jeopardy reruns, but I couldn't wait. Come join me. I continued to stand and stare. A mix of horror and anger filled me. Stacy, I whispered. How did you get in here? Oh, I've had copies of your keys for years, she said joyously. I just never used them until today. I got copies of your car keys, work keys, and a pair that I believe opened your parents' house. I thought you knew. I lost it. Filled with fury, I screamed at her louder and harsher than I have ever screamed at anyone in my life. 
I told her I hated her. I didn't want her anywhere near me. I told her I would be filing a restraining order. And I pulled out my phone to call the police. I charged her with breaking. Now get the fuck out before they arrest you. I ended softly, panting in anger. She clicked the TV off. She turned to face me. Call them, she said calmly. I told you, they always believe the girl. She smiled. I began threatening her again, but she interrupted me and got up calmly. Look, she began. I get it. I do. You've made yourself very clear. I didn't want it to come to this, but you didn't give me any choice. She picked up her purse, rustled its contents, and pulled something out. In her hand was a small pistol. She raised it slowly. I told you, they always believe the girl. She began. Stacy, wait! I belowed. Wait, we can talk about... But the bang cut me off. I fell to the ground, hands over my head, lying fetal. But the pain never came, only a soft ringing in my ears. I opened my eyes and lying in front of me was Stacy. Where her left eye used to be was a bullet-sized gaping hole. A mixture of blood, pus, and brains ooze pus in the hole. I stared in, panting loudly, noticing her brain twitch softly for the last time. Blood dripped from her nose. Her left hand index finger flickered slightly as her life left her. The police arrived after my neighbor reported the gunshot. I was brought into the station where I detailed everything that had transpired the weeks before. However, everything went out the window when a detective came into the room reporting the contents of Stacy's letter. Before leaving my apartment, Stacy left a handwritten note in her bedroom. It accused me of beating her, abusing her, and threatening to keep quiet about everything. She wrote that she was terrified that I would kill her in my rage, and she mentioned I kept firearms in my apartment. She ended her note by stating that if anyone found her note, it was probably too late. I had killed her already. I was placed under arrest and in a holding cell for the night. I am writing this hoping that someone believes me and sees what actually happened. But I'm afraid Stacy was right. They'll always believe the girl. What happened to me yesterday was the most horrifying experience I faced. I, as a person, who some people may consider as a workaholic, worked in two different jobs. I worked as a recruiter during the day and as a waitress at night. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I spent more time at my house as I was working remotely as a recruiter. The second job I have mentioned was a part-time job, so I was able to work and have some time to spare for myself. The only difficulty I was facing was the fact that I had to take a bus to the coffee shop I was working in. My shift would begin around 6 a.m., so it was not difficult to go there, but my shift would end at midnight. Thus, I would have to rush to the bus stop to return to my house. Even though I hated rushing to catch a bus, I liked my job. And I liked the fact that I would be outside even though it was midnight. Enjoying the chilling breeze of the night every night was therapeutic. Yesterday was just like the other days. I worked full-time as a recruiter at my house and went out when I finished my work. The coffee shop was not really crowded, and I spent most of the time chatting with my colleagues. As my shift ended, I quickly went to the bus stop. The bus stop was on a road that few cars or people would pass by. It could hardly be called a bus stop, as it was just an area with a bench and a sign. The metal bench was rusty, and the movement had graffiti on it. Considering that this bus stop was in an isolated location where only a few would wait, I could understand the dirtiness of it. I checked the time 
and realized that I had run faster than usual as mm. I was there five minutes earlier mm. than I usually am. As I started mm. to wait for the bus to arrive, I saw a shadowy figure walking towards the bus stop. When he passed under the flickering streetlight, I was able to take a good look at him. He had his hoodie on, and his hands were in his pockets. He seemed young. He had a slight hump back, and he was strolling. I began to feel goosebumps as he approached the bus stop. It was the first time I saw someone else would take the bus from there. Around that time was enough to scare me, and his posture was only making things worse. As he came to the bus stop, he sat on the bench. I walked a little bit further to avoid being too close to him. Another minute passed. He began to whistle this unnerving melody. He whistled the same melody over and over again. After whistling for a minute, he stopped. At first, I was relieved that he had stopped. But the silence started to bother me. I felt like it was the silence before the storm. After several seconds of torturous silence, the man got up. He stood there, still his hands in his pockets, opened his mouth, and started to let out a mournful well. He looked at me as he made the sound, slowly lifting his hands and pointing toward me. I was petrified. A drop of cold sweat fell from my forehead to the ground. He raised his other arm towards me and started to speak. The bus will not arrive. His low voice sent shivers down my spine. I was so scared that I could not move a single muscle. He started to approach slowly. The way he walked resembled a zombie. As he came right next to me, he began to observe me. Without touching me, he started to smell me. I can still remember the high-pitched, inhaling sound he made as he continued to smell me. You are one of us now, he whispered, while I could do nothing but experience that terrorizing moment as he held my shoulders. Very quickly, my survival instincts kicked in, and I could move my muscles again. I pushed him as hard as I could. From the impact, he lost his balance and fell to the ground. Still making the horrible wailing sound, he grabbed my ankle. I panicked and kicked his head. My reaction made him angry as he tightened his grip. His fingernails stabbed my ankles as his grip got more forceful. I kicked for several times until he let go. He lay on the ground, holding his head while crying. You betrayed us, he said with a disappointed voice. I heard the sound of the bus coming closer, and I turned around to see if it was coming. I could not have been much happier to catch a bus quickly coming closer. We shall see each other again, the man whispered. I turned around to see him, but when I turned around, I could not see anyone. The bus stopped before me, and with a calming, whistling sound, its doors were open. As soon as I got on the bus, I started to speak with the driver and tell him what had happened. I could see the horror in his eyes as he said, You have seen the night whisperer. People that live here hear the welling sound of this creature, and some believe that it was coming from a ghost. It became an urban legend around here. So you are saying that the night whisperer was a man in a dark hoodie? I do not believe he was a man, dear. I think you have encountered a spirit. Obviously, I did not believe him, but I was still shocked by the recent incident. My body did not stop shaking for a couple of minutes. The driver tried his best to comfort me, and realizing that there were no other passengers on the bus, he offered to take me to a police station. I thanked him and accepted his offer. When I got off the bus, I rushed into the station. Officers saw me, and realizing my frightened state, directed their attention to me. They listened as I told them about the night whisperer, including the folk tales the driver told me. After listening to my story, they gave me a glass of water, and one of the officers began to speak. We started to receive complaints about the wailing sound around that area two months ago. 
At first, we did not focus on it as it seemed less important considering the other duties we had. But after a while, the complaints began to pile up and we knew that we had to check it out. We tried our best to find the source of the sound, but we could not find it. Then, we began to hear that children and women were disappearing. Another officer came next to us with some papers and a pen. She placed them on the table and listened as the other officer continued his speech. We started an investigation in the area. We have found some people like you that claim to be witnesses of the Night Whisperer, as they called it. The investigation is still ongoing, but we believe that a suspect is a man in his 20s with a mental disorder or a drug addiction. Either way, your report will be helpful for the investigation. I wrote what I went through in detail and left the station. As I was walking back to my house, in a shadowy corner of a back alley, I saw the figure again. I know where you live. They cannot save you, he shouted, and started to make the wailing sound. I ran back to the station and asked for protection. They told me that they could escort me to my place. They left me right in front of my house. As I went inside my house, I called my employer and told him that I wanted to quit my job as a waitress. Upon hearing what happened to me, he understandingly accepted my resignation. After that incident, I could not sleep nor go outside. I know it has only been a day after it, but I am scared that this trauma will haunt me for years. Even now, I can still hear the uncanny wail of the man. Looking out of my window, I sometimes see shapes shifting inside the shadows and feel in utter disturbance. I am getting more and more paranoid every hour. I cannot get rid of the feeling of being watched. I hope the police find the suspect as soon as possible, or I won't be able to survive going through these challenging days. The world of horror content creators is not easy. People ask and ask for new videos without knowing how long it takes us to make them. I'm James. I'm 19. But until I was 17, I was a well-known urban explorer. In my early days, I was a paranormal investigator, but I never found anything, and my audience was getting bored. I went viral in a video that surpassed a million views, but my subscribers started to drop over time. After a few months of unremarkable content, I stopped making horror videos and dedicated myself only to explorations. My channel started growing again. Eventually, I made a new series of videos that consisted of me having the challenge of staying all night in different places. In the first videos, I stayed in the post office building, in a shopping mall, and a huge gym. For the next video, I had to target the most complicated place I had done so far. Walmart. I had everything planned. I was going to hide behind some cushions at closing time. I had a backpack with water and food. I didn't plan to steal. Since there were cameras and they could expose me if they caught me, in the worst case scenario, I preferred to keep it all as a teenage prank. Come nightfall, everything went as expected. The guards seemed to look around the place without much interest, more focused on going home than finding someone hiding. I decided to let the time pass by sleeping, setting my cell phone alarm to ring a few hours later. In the early morning, I was awakened by the sound of my cell phone, and I pulled back the pillows. I looked around and confirmed that my plan had been a success. I was alone. I started to investigate the Walmart. I entertained myself in the game section and even watched the TVs for a while, documenting everything that was going on. At first, I thought this was going to be a complicated video to make, but it turned out to be the easiest one I had made so far. I was having a lot of fun exploring the place, but it all ended when I peeked into the food section and realized one thing. I wasn't alone. At first, I thought a guard had stayed longer without me knowing, but that person was dressed differently. The man was in a black t-shirt and short shorts, standing casually looking at the dairy prices. Upon noticing me, the man turned around, looking me straight in the eye and started calling me like a dog, crouching down and whistling at me. 
As he slowly walked towards my position, I lowered the camera and stopped filming out of fear. I didn't know why, but this person didn't look like someone else making a challenge or perhaps a homeless man. This person was someone who wanted to catch me and hurt me. As the man came closer and closer, my body, paralyzed with terror, managed to move back a few centimeters. Many people often question me and say that if they were me, they would have ran in desperation. But you'll never know how you'll react in such a situation until you're in there. As I stood there, I felt like an animal terrified of its natural predator. Standing there at 17 years old, thinking about how to escape, the face of evil slowly approached me. A few seconds later, which felt like minutes, he was already very close to me. Despite my fear, my body remembered how to react, and I ran away as far as I could from that man. Somehow, in just a few meters, I had him next to me again. His face was even worse than before. At least he was looking at me with curiosity. But since I ran, his face was only of happiness and malice. I thought about reasoning with him, but before I could speak, the man hit me very hard with his right hand, knocking me to the ground. I tried to stop him, but he climbed on top of me and prevented me from getting up. Tears ran down my eyes in despair, and he punched me incessantly in the face, smiling. My tears were confused with blood spurting out of my face. I felt like I was going to faint at any moment. The man seemed aware of my situation, so he stopped hitting me, and without saying anything, pulled a knife out of his pants. He looked at me smiling and threatening to stab me in the chest, but stopped halfway and continued laughing, tormenting me. Before I could react, he grabbed my right hand and slowly plunged his knife into my palm. The pain was indiscernible, as he did not immediately stab my hand. The man slowly pierced the knife in and began to twist it hatefully. Meanwhile, his eyes were still fixed on me. This man did not care about the damage he was causing me, but he enjoyed seeing the expression of pain on my face. A few seconds later, I heard loud noises behind us. It was the police who had somehow found us. The man pulled the knife out of my body and went running quickly to them to try to kill them. But with several shots in the leg, he realized he wasn't going to win and had to give up. At first, they didn't trust me either. But after seeing that I was just a kid with bruises on my face and a huge hole in my hand, they had no choice but to believe me. When I was finally reassured that my life was no longer at risk, I closed my eyes and collapsed to the ground. The policeman rushed me to the hospital, but I had lost too much blood. Shortly after waking up and receiving the scold of my life from my angry but concerned parents, I learned that Walmart was not going to press charges for trespassing during the night. Even though no guards are monitoring the whole place, they have lots of cameras and people monitoring them at times. So they witnessed everything that had happened between me and this psycho. Speaking of him, neither the police nor my parents told me much. But a few days later, I saw the news and I dropped the remote control out of fear. The man was a cannibal who enjoys savagely beating his food unconscious before devouring it. Today, I don't know what life will be like for this man or the rest of my acquaintances who had urban exploration. But after that day, I knew I had to give up this type of content. I won't have the same amount of viewers, but lately, I started telling stories of psychopathic killers. A lot of people think they're lies or that they're exaggerated, but they don't know how exaggerated reality can be and how a man almost devoured me in a Walmart. My name's Edward, and I turned 18 last month. I finished high school two months ago, and now I'm preparing to start studying cooking. My dream is to be a recognized chef. I've been cooking by myself for almost five years, since the day I decided that I was never going to eat out again. People tell me that my decision is a bit extreme, and that I should get over it, because there's nothing nicer than trying new flavors from different chefs. They may be right 
but if they had experienced what I did that night, they wouldn't want to go to eat again either. That February night, I was only 12 years old. My parents were about to take me out to eat at my favorite place in the world, McDonald's. I remembered how anxious I was that day. I remember that day I was very anxious to go since I hadn't eaten all day. I wanted to save my appetite for the huge cheddar burger I was going to eat. I was also a big fan of french fries. My parents always left me theirs because they knew I could never get enough with the ones they gave me. I was thinking about the food for so long that before I knew it, we had arrived and I ran to the counter to place my order. The place was empty and it made sense. It was a Tuesday at 2 a.m., and I didn't expect anyone else to be around. Normally, kids my age are asleep, but since my parents were coming home from work late and usually stayed up late, it was convenient for them that I was awake at the same time they were. They hadn't even finished getting out of the car, and I was already in the driveway staring at the cashier, not holding back the urge to ask her for my combo. When she looked back at me, somewhat surprised, I noticed something about her that caught my attention. The girl was noticeably very dirty. Her uniform was full of stains. She had no makeup on, and her messy hair reached her face where she was biting at it. A few seconds later, my parents joined me and began to order. I was still hungry, I won't deny it, but I was distracted by the hateful face the girl was looking at me with. Had I done something wrong? Why was she looking at me like that? I decided not to pay any more attention to her and just order my food. My parents ordered a normal combo and a Coke. Unlike them, I didn't like it, so I ordered a 7-Up and a huge combo. My parents looked at me in surprise. They didn't understand how I ate so much without getting fat. A few seconds later, our order had arrived. I ran up to the cashier and saw that girl again. But something had changed. She was looking at me with a big smile on her face, as if she was happy to see me take the food. At that moment, I thought maybe I had misjudged her. She was just having a bad night, but she sure was a good person. My parents grabbed the trays, and when the girl told me to enjoy my food, I thanked her and smiled back. As I tasted the food, the urge to continue eating quickly disappeared. This was not because I was already satisfied. In fact, I was still hungry. But it was because the food tasted funny. The soda tasted a little bitter, and the hamburger tasted like metal. The fries were strangely slimy, and after a while, my hunger went away. I didn't want to say anything to my parents. They seemed to be enjoying their food. So I just went to the bathroom without telling them it was to throw up. After throwing up in the bathroom, I felt much better. I wasn't ready to keep eating, but I heard that 7-Up was good for the tummy, so I was going to keep drinking. As I came out of the bathroom, I heard a noise from a hallway. It was a lot of voices laughing, including the girl who had waited us. I don't know if it was because I was young or because I was curious to know what it was like to work in a McDonald's, so I decided to cross the aisle and sneak a peek in. Unlike the rest of the McDonald's, the kitchen looked very neglected, as if the cleaning shifts were only valid for what the general public sees. At the table, the food was loose. Pieces of bread and lettuce were scattered all over the place. Unpreserved hamburgers tomatoes, and even silverware on the floor. I was surprised by the number of cockroaches I saw. I didn't want to focus on looking at the floor anymore because I knew that if I kept inspecting it, I would inevitably see a rat wandering around. I kept inspecting with my eyes without getting too close until I heard some voices and pulled back again. What I saw made me want to vomit all over again. Several employees stood together, blowing their noses into a cooked hamburger patty. One of them was spitting in the fries, and in the distance, another was pulling up his fly with an uncovered glass of soda. Seeing this made me dizzy. My eyesight became blurry, and I felt like I was going to vomit again for sure. This couldn't be happening. Surely it was a mistake. Surely it was my imagination. I ran stumbling over things to my table. My parents were very scared to see me, but I didn't pay attention to them. I just went to my food. I opened the drink, which was supposed to be transparent, and there I saw it. My soda had a slight yellow color. I began to try to understand in terror why it had that color, and as I remembered, I panicked. Not long ago, I had seen how the employees were urinating in the drinks. Surely later they used the same glass to fill them with soda, and by putting the lid on, 
They prevented the smell or anyone from noticing the color. I began to vomit violently all over the place while my parents held me and asked me what was wrong. The girl who waited on us ran up to me in a panic and asked me if I was okay. She saw me from a distance opening the soda and checking the food. She knew I had possibly discovered them and was terrified. The young woman put her hand on my back, but I slapped it away, and that's when I realized she had a band-aid on her finger, and she didn't have that before. I remembered the metal taste of the hamburger, and thought that it was the same taste I feel when I cut my finger and put it in my mouth. I recovered a bit to open the burger, and there it was. That condiment was not ketchup. It was much less thick, and a stronger red. That was blood. Dizzy, I threw out all the fries, and they were still slimy. What could it be? Snot? Saliva? Suddenly, I started to feel dizzy, and from one moment to the next, everything went white. I stopped feeling my body as my vision faded. I saw myself falling towards the floor, and then nothing. I woke up many hours later in a hospital. My head was bandaged, and I was very dizzy. My parents told me that I lost consciousness and hit my head on the table when I fell. I was losing blood, and everyone was worried about me, but apparently it was only a superficial blow. Despite that, I still remembered perfectly everything that happened, and I told my parents. At first, they didn't believe me. Apparently, their food was fine, but after convincing them, they knew I wasn't lying, trusted me, and sued the McDonald's. After the money and many years, my parents ended up losing the lawsuit. There was no proof other than the word of a 14-year-old boy who told the story after a hard blow to the head. My parents could do nothing against the ruthless lawyers of a company as big as this one. We may not have won the lawsuit, and those employees may have gotten away with it, but I learned my lesson. From that day on, I was never going to let some stranger cook for me again. I may have caught the McDonald's employees, but who knows how many times I will have eaten something with a stranger's blood in it. Hi, my name is Ethan, and I'm 37 years old. During my youth in the 1990s, a horror fad was taking over the world, popularized in movies, television, and even books. These new horror icons were clowns. The craze took over the world, but was replaced years later with something new. However, for me, the fear never left. That chilly night in October left a deeply rooted phobia towards clowns that still lives with me to this day. During the 1990s, my dad and I developed a weekly tradition. It started when I was eight years old and ended that dreaded day in October. Every Saturday morning, he would take me to McDonald's for our father-son weekend breakfast ritual. Without a veil, we'd be sitting in our usual booth at 8 a.m. sharp every Saturday morning. It was like clockwork. But one morning, when I was 10, something was slightly different. That morning I did the usual. I got out of the car and pulled the entrance to the door, causing a sharp ding chime. The familiar aroma of fresh hash browns and syrup greeted me. I ran to our booth to wait while my dad ordered our food. But I noticed something different. In the lobby stood a tall and brightly colored clown. He wore a large yellow suit with exposed striped socks and a long sleeve shirt. His hair and nose were as red as the stripes on his socks. His face was as white as the snow, creating a strong contrast. He wore a comically large red smile and shoes. The clown was busy with other boys and girls that hugged him and posed for pictures. They all laughed together as the disposable cameras flashed in the hands of proud parents. My dad joined me sitting in the booth. Did you see? He gestured towards the lobby. Want to go take a picture? The clown looked happy. He looked fun. He looked like the clown that had attended my friend Andy's party. I jumped out of my seat and rushed over to him. By then, the clown had sat on a chair. Our eyes met among the laughter of the running children in bustling kitchen. Hello, little boy, he said in a rambunctious, goofy voice. Would you like to take a picture? He waved his yellow-gloved hand. Can I, Dad? I asked anxiously. He nodded. I ran to the clown. He patted his lap twice. Ah, hold on, said my dad. Let me go find the camera. 
the bell chimed as he exited. I sat on the clown's lap. My name's Ronald, he said joyously. Ronald McDonald. What's your name? I sat in silence, conflicted by my instruction to not talk to strangers and to not be rude to your elders. He didn't insist. He stared forward, grinning his crimson smile. I began to feel tension in the air. Something about his wide eyes and blood-red mouth made me uncomfortable. For 20 seconds, we sat together until his neck began to crane forward, bringing his mouth close to my ear. I'm going to fucking kill you, Ethan, he whispered in my ear. The goofy tone was gone, replaced by a deep and raspy snarl. My ten-year-old brain didn't comprehend what had been said. I knew one of those words was a bad word that I wasn't allowed to say. But to kill me? Was this a joke? I hadn't told him my name. How did he know I was Ethan? A familiar ding announced my dad's arrival, and seconds later, a flash illuminated my nervous smile. Okay, bye, I said anxiously. He stared at me and walked away, blank smile and wide-eyed. By that evening, any discomfort about the interaction had washed off me. I ran up my stairs after dinner to play some video games before bed. At 10 p.m., just as I was getting into bed, a click came through my window. I ignored it. A second one came. I approached the window, and just then, the third rock came and hit the glass. I stared down. He was there. On my front lawn, that clown that called himself Ronald stood. He waved his yellow wave with one hand and curled his index finger on his other hand, gesturing me to come down. Do you want to play, Ethan? He snarled. The shock of his voice made me fall back on the ground. But when I got up and looked out, he was gone. The following week I entered my classroom and my stomach plummeted when I saw him standing next to Mr. Scott in front of the class. They discussed that Ronald was visiting to raise awareness for a certain charity. He smiled and talked in his goofy voice. I found it odd he was alone in attendance, but pushed the thought away. On my way out of class, he stared me down and waved. Bye, Ethan. That weekend, my family went to dinner at McDonald's. Driving into the parking lot, I began to get nervous. I was anxious. But to my relief, Ronald was nowhere to be seen. We sat in our usual booth as the tension began to ease up inside me. Just as our food was being served, I jumped from my seat and headed to the bathroom to wash my hands. I scrubbed, rinsed, and I dried my hands, my stomach aching in hunger. When something hit my shoe, I recoiled in fear. It was a roll of toilet paper. It had slid from under a stall. A voice came from inside the stall. Excuse me. Do you think I can get some help? The voice sounded like an elderly man. My TP ran away. <laughs> he chuckled. I slowly kicked the toilet paper closer to the stall when a hand grabbed my ankle from the open space under the stall. Ah! I writhed in pain. The nails digging deep in my skin. The hand pulled me towards the stall, causing my shin to break against the bottom of the wooden stall, sending splinters everywhere. My body fell with the pain, flat on the ground, and I began to be pulled underneath the bottom of the stall. It was Ronald. He crouched in the stall, makeup smeared with blood, and pulled me in. I told you I would fucking kill you, he growled. My screams of agony coming to a halt, I looked down at my shin that had struck the wood and saw the bottom of the leg bent perpendicular to the rest of it. The clown pulled out a knife and struck me in the arm, somehow making the unbearable pain worse. Just then, the bathroom door burst open as I heard my dad screaming my name. But everything began to go dark. The last image I saw was the clown raise the knife and strike my other arm. I let the darkness take me away. I awoke hours later in the hospital. I had two broken bones and multiple stab wounds. I had lost a lot of blood but I was told I'd make a full recovery. Ronald McDonald was actually a man named Rick Dillard. He was an escape prisoner and registered sex offender. He had been living in hiding, coming out only in full costume and makeup to hide the face that had been plastered all over the news. Upon his arrest, 
Police found pictures of other children in his apartment, his next targets. I looked at death in the face and somehow managed to escape. I was lucky to have gotten out alive with nothing more than a phobia to clowns, two stab wounds on my arms, and an aversion towards McDonald's. To this day, despite being 37 years old and the diminished popularization of clowns around the world, fear and panic strikes deep at the sight of that restaurant and its mascot. My name is Nadia, and I am 27 years old. I have two university degrees and I'm doing well in my job. I'm working all year round, so when vacations come, I immediately go to the mountains to rest. My friends sometimes tell me to go to the beach, but I tell them that the sand and the sun are not my things. None of this is true, but I never dared tell them what was really going on. Every time I think of the beach, Horrible images invade my thoughts. Memories of a terrifying night when, just because I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, I almost didn't survive to remember it. I was only 13 years old and on vacation with my father. He and my mom were separated, so I had to divide my time to be with both of them. I had just come from a mini vacation with my mom. And now I had to spend a few days at my dad's beach house. The first few days went by fast. I was distracted by meeting people and going out to eat in the evenings. So the vacation was going by fast. Everything changed one Tuesday night. That day was usually the day that the beaches were less visited. I was returning from an evening dinner with my father, and we decided to walk along the beach. This was usually not recommended, as the beach can be very unsafe in the dark. But my father, who had been coming to this house since his childhood, assured me that nothing would happen to us. The night was coming along well. The darkness did not scare me, and seeing the beach in the dark and silence was a new experience that made me feel very good. I got a little ahead of my dad and ran along the beach until some lights caught my attention. There were a bunch of men in white robes in front of me. Some of them were holding candle lanterns, while others were together carrying a large bundle. It didn't take me more than a few seconds to realize what was inside that bundle. It was a human body. I couldn't see the human form, but the size was that of an adult, and I could see the blood dripping from the black bag. My first reaction was to run crying, but before I could do anything, my father was already looking at the same scene as me, except that he was not hiding. As soon as he saw the image, fear took hold of my father. He gave a muffled scream and ran away without looking in my direction. The hooded men turned around and saw him. Some came closer to where I was still without seeing me. But as soon as they could see my father's back, they seemed to be satisfied, so they went back to where they were and continued on their way. Although I was scared too, I managed to keep my composure and stay calm enough to slip away without making any noise. When I arrived at the beach house, he was already packing all his things in desperation immediately asking me to do the same. I went to my room to put all of my stuff away. Luckily, I brought very little luggage, so I was done pretty quickly. I heard a strange noise coming from outside, so I left my bags under the bed and peeked out the window. On the other side, shadows moved quickly and stealthily behind my house. Suddenly, I felt a loud knock the entrance of our house, and I could barely react, as a bunch of footsteps invaded our vacation home. As soon as I heard the noises, I ducked under my bed with a knife to protect myself and put the suitcase in front of me so they wouldn't see me. Behind it, I could see how a pile of boots covered with the same white tunic I had seen on the beach surrounded the house. Some of them came into my room 
but left without much interest when they saw it empty. I kept taking deep breaths and praying that my father might escape, but as if in response, I heard his screams coming from his room, and within seconds, noises of him being dragged through the house. The men in white dragged him into the dining room, and for the first time, I could see him from under the bed. One of them approached him and told him he had interrupted a sacrifice that they were making to appease the wrath of the sea, which was adamant about offerings. My father tearfully asked for forgiveness, but none of these people were the least bit interested in listening to him. While some of them held him by his arms and legs on the dining room floor, the one who spoke approached him with a knife and drew some symbols on his belly with a pen. They were symbols I had never seen before, but that was the least of our worries. The man threw the pen to the side of the house, and another one of the hooded men carefully picked it up and put it away. The man who was talking and drawing was clearly the leader. The leader then began to rub the knife across the patterns on my father's body, marking him while ignoring his screams. Suddenly, he tightened his grip on the knife and cut open his stomach. He was still alive, so in complete panic. I could see not only the knife being plunged into him, but all his guts being pulled out and stuffed into black bags. His screams of pain choked as he lost consciousness. These men did not care whether he was alive or not. They simply removed his organs with precision, very violently and quickly, but with surgical precision. You could tell that they had already done it several times and had practice, not to mention that they were completely desensitized to human life. After they finished, they simply gathered up all their bags and left, while others stayed behind to clean up any traces of blood or anything that might incapacitate them. After several minutes, the last men were leaving. I didn't know how to react. I had witnessed everything that had happened to my father, and somehow, they hadn't detected me. The men had already left, so I threw the suitcase and prepared to leave. But the footsteps continued, and a man came rushing into my room after hearing the noise I made. By the time he came in, I had already hidden again, but he knew something was wrong. This person ran my suitcase and saw me. He tried to reach for me with his hands as I went backwards, and after a few seconds, he managed to grab my leg. When he pulled me back, I used the knife I kept with me, and with my eyes closed, I stabbed him in the eyes. Instead of running, I pressed the knife into his face and made sure it went in as far as possible. When I was sure he was dead, I ran out of the house with my cell phone and called my mom, who thought everything I told her was a lie. After coming to look for me and calling the police, they found no trace of my father, but they knew who the culprits were. As their leader had said, the murderers were part of a clan that was dedicated to making sacrifices for the sea. They could never find them, as they always perform their rituals at a random place and time. After that, I went back to my mother and decided to never go to the beach again, even if I went to one far away. I would feel that those people would be there, looking for me to finish their work. Before I tell you my story, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jonah, and I'm currently 19. The story I'm about to tell you happened to me when I was 11 years old. As the only child of a wealthy family, I used to be very noisy and spoiled. My father would go on business trips every month and stay in other countries for days. He was a hardworking man, but his ambitions caused me to spend my childhood fatherless. However, my mother was always there for me, and being rich helped us a lot. Although I lived a life that a child could only dream of, everything changed when I was 11. We began to receive news and letters from different banks that would describe how much debt we were in. It didn't take long to realize that my father's company was bankrupt. Everything happened so fast. 
in a couple of months, our family became poor. My father, instead of being around us, decided to divorce my mother and flee the country as soon as possible. Thus, we were left behind with no money. But the terrorizing event that I'll tell you about now happened after all this chaos we faced. My mother started to work so that she could provide food and shelter for me. We moved to a tiny and dirty flat with one room in it. The neighborhood was not trustworthy to say the very least. I could always hear people crying, shouting, and beating each other in the streets. Every night, I would wake up with loud sounds of guns being fired off. I hated living there. There was nothing we could do. This place was the best we could afford at the time. One day, my mother returned from work. She opened the door and came inside the flat. I could see that she had brought a friend with her. Her friend was an older man with white hair and a long beard. Something was unsettling about this guy's eyes. He had dark brown eyes with wrinkles around them. What made me creeped out by his eyes was how he was looking at me. At his first glance upon me, his eyes shined with unearthly madness and an incredible sense of joy. He opened his mouth and showed his toothless gingiva. He was trying to smile, but all I could see was an endless void. Unexpectedly, he was a very muscular older man. I could see some scars on his arms that looked like knife wounds. My mother introduced the man to me and started to tell me how they met. This older man was our neighbor. He was living downstairs with his sick wife. This older man was my mother's hero, as she told me several times. Around a couple of minutes, I was introduced to this man. When my mother was on her way home from work, a couple of teenage thugs from the neighborhood had tried to mug her. She told me that the older man had come running to rescue her. He saved my mother, which is why she invited him to our flat. After hearing this story, my prejudices toward the older man replaced themselves with a sense of gratefulness and admiration. We started to talk. At first, he seemed a bit weird, but after a while, we began to enjoy the conversation. There was laughter and joy. He sat with us for three hours, and as he was about to leave, he hugged me. His grip was way too strong, and his breath smelled like garbage. As he was hugging me, he said, Oh, you're such a good child that I just want to take you to my house and caress your hair for hours. His strange sentence creeped me out, but my mother took it as an act of affection. He wished us a good night and glanced at me one more time before he left. After he left, I went to bed and started to sleep around 3 a.m. I woke up because of a troubling and familiar smell. At first, I didn't understand why the smell was so familiar, but when I opened my eyes, I realized that the smell was the older man's breath. I saw his face right on mine. He was leaning over me with an open mouth. The room was dim because of the moonlight shining through the window, and that dimness allowed me to see the red veins in this man's terrifying eyes. He grinned as he looked at my frightened face, and a drop of saliva fell from his mouth onto my cheek. He whispered very quietly, Don't worry, Tim. Your daddy will always protect you. It freaked me out. I remember everything going dark after seeing that horrible scene. I fainted, and when I regained consciousness, it was already the afternoon. I searched the house to find out if the older man was hiding somewhere, but I couldn't see him or my mother at the flat. That time was around 2 p.m., so I figured my mother was just at work. It was probably just a nightmare, I thought, and I continued hanging out inside the flat as if nothing happened. When the night fell upon our wretched neighborhood, I heard a fright that had started on the street. I peeked from the window, and I saw my mother lying on the ground while the older man was frightening two young people. I rushed outside, screaming and crying, Mother, you all right? Mother! The old man fought off the youngsters and told them to help me carry my mother inside our flat. Still shaken by the nightmare I saw, I hesitated to trust him, but I realized it was the most logical thing I could do in that situation. We carried my mother inside, and the man told me that she was not badly injured. I thanked him as he tried to wake my mother. After several attempts, he gave up. Realizing that she would not wake up, I started to get worried. My worries grew bigger as I saw the man smiling and looking at me as if I was a prize he wanted to have. Tim, your daddy missed you. Your mama is ill. Do you want to see her and hug her? He said as he approached me. My name is not Tim. Stop calling me that. I shouted as I grabbed the chair next to me. My arm shook because the chair was heavier than I thought. He laughed and said, You would not hurt your daddy, would you? Put the chair down, Timmy, and let me take you to our house. Your mother missed you. As he came closer, 
I hit him as hard as I could. His voice changed, and I could sense his anger. Timothy, you will listen to your father. You are coming with me, he yelled as he pulled the chair out of my hand and grabbed me by my hair. He dragged me to his flat downstairs. As he opened the door, I started to smell the disturbing scent of the house. What I saw in that house is still the reason for my sleepless nights today. I saw a skeleton-like figure lying on the couch with rotten skin. The corpse's skin looked like it had melted and mixed with the sofa. I screamed as hard as I could. I tried to escape as the old man called me Tim and told me to stop frightening my dad. I knew that I wouldn't survive this if I didn't fight dirty. So I bit the older man's hand so hard that I actually ripped a piece of the flesh out. He let go of me as he shouted curses and I ran upstairs. I got inside my home and locked the door. When I got inside, I saw that my mother was conscious and already calling the police. She told me that it was the older man who knocked her unconscious. While we waited for the cops to arrive, the older man tried to break into our place for 10 minutes straight and finally managed to do so. As he burst open the door, my mother and I screamed so loud. At that moment, we heard police sirens. The older man jumped on us and I could understand that his only intention at that point was to kill us. We tried our best to defend ourselves as he punched and scratched us. He maniacally continued to hurt us until we heard gunshots. The older man got shot several times and his motionless body fell onto me. After that incident happened, the police told us about the older man. He was a mentally unstable man who had lost his child 15 years ago. His son, Timothy, was my age when he died. The older man and his wife were going through depression after losing their only child. Upon searching the house, the police identified the corpse on the couch as the older man's wife. They told me that after his wife died, the man lost his sanity and tried to recreate his family. He was most probably planning to keep me locked up in his flat and pretend like I was his son, little Tim. To this day, I still don't know how to react to all of this. But in my dreams, I see little Tim looking at me through the mirror and smiling with purple lips. My name is Alan. I'm 29 years old. And I work in customer service in a call center. My job is to make sure that all the customers have internet signal, since they call us every time it fails. I'll be honest, the signal my company sells is terrible, so we get a lot of calls every day. When I started working here two years ago, I didn't care about the days off or the hours. I just needed the money. Not only did I agree to work weekends, which is when they pay the most, but I also offered to work the night shift, since I would have to be paid for night hours. When I started, I was really comfortable, no matter what time I worked. I knew that a lot of people would call in to complain, but obviously, there would be fewer people on the night shift. Also, many calls on the night shift during the weekend were just prank calls from bored teenagers, or others who maybe had one too many beers and forgot to turn on the internet or their cell phone. All in all, I was having a good time. I was having a lot of fun in the job. Everything was going perfectly, until one day ruined everything. We usually leave at 11 p.m., and since it was a Friday, I couldn't wait to leave. But a few minutes before the scheduled time, the computer phone rang. On the other side of the phone was an elderly man. In these cases, we can't hang up the phone until the consultation is over, so I couldn't leave. That phone call lasted more than half an hour, and I was just furious inside. By the time I finished shutting down the system, the lights were already out and my colleagues had already left. I left my office with total indifference, even somewhat content that I was finally leaving, when I noticed a strange smell. It was like a burning smell, but there was no smoke. Normally I would investigate for the source of the smell, but I immediately sensed that something was wrong. Aside from the smell, I felt a pressure all over my body. Something in the atmosphere was wrong. My body started to feel weak, as if something was making me sick little by little. The only thing I knew was that I wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. I couldn't stay in that place a minute longer. I walked through the company's warehouse road to the elevator that led to the parking lot, but something caught my attention halfway through. The elevator was open and its lights were on. I thought that surely someone had called it and suddenly opted for the stairs, but this idea quickly disappeared as I approached a little closer. 
A strange figure inside the elevator peered out of the corner, just staring at me. The man could not hide his whole body, but still, he did not give up and watched me as if I did not see him. He was naked and clearly had some mental deficiency, so I made the safest decision and headed for the warehouse's employee's office. I wasn't sure if there was any of them left, but they usually stay a few minutes longer, and I needed someone to accompany me to the parking lot. But halfway through, a light caught my attention. The smell that was making me sick before became much stronger. Even though I was scared of that man in the elevator, at no time could I stop thinking the atmosphere was becoming more and more oppressive. It was like being trapped inside a nightmare that was consuming me second by second. My whole body was screaming for me to immediately get away from that source of light. But I really had nowhere to go. And to be honest, my brain rejected those unjustified sensations that my body was feeling, just to understand what was making me feel so bad. As I looked out, I could see about 10 people, three of whom I recognized as warehouse employees. They were dressed very exaggeratedly and were dancing and laughing in front of the decapitated head of a chicken. At the side, two men were naked with drawings all over their bodies. They stared at each other, touching their faces and imitating their movements as if they were different sides of the same mirror. When I saw this, fear took over my body and my blood froze. I'm not religious, nor do I believe in satanic possessions or spells, but there is something I do believe in. Those warehouse employees were known to be very violent. Several of them had a reputation for getting into fights just for fun and threatening anyone who passed by, and I was sure that none of them would appreciate my presence in that place. I wanted to quickly head for the exit and pretend I hadn't seen anything, but my muscles were so tense that I couldn't help stomping on a shelf. I couldn't handle the fear and desperately ran to the elevator. Already in the safety of the lights and the background music of that small space, I quickly pressed the parking button, but the doors would not close. A hand was stopping the elevator and a face was peeking over the doors. To my absolute petrification, the person from before, a middle-aged, ill-groomed man, was standing in front of me, just staring blankly at my face. Before I could react, he began to spit on me while laughing out loud. My only reaction was to curl up on the floor and scream my lungs out. I felt pain in all my articulations and my eyes hurt from pressing them so hard. I was at the mercy of whatever happened to me. Suddenly, the laughter abruptly stopped and changed to screams while the maniac began to kick the side of the elevator full of hatred and violence. In an act of bravery, I jumped for the button that closed the door. As the doors closed and my attacker walked away in boredom, I could see in the distance two eyes that I could not distinguish staring at my position. I couldn't make out who it was, but by the light from the elevator, the person certainly saw me. Was it one of the strangers or a member of the warehouse? If it was one of the latter, would they have recognized me? All these questions flooded my thoughts. I just ran to my car and accelerated. After that, nothing was the same. Every workday, I could see the warehouse guys constantly peering through the big window that overlooked our office. I can swear that they watched me much more than the rest of my colleagues, and that sooner or later, they were going to do something to me. But I admit that I was paranoid, and that maybe they didn't pay more attention to me than the rest. Maybe they even always looked at us like that. A few days later, I started to pack my bags to move and never come back. But I realized a message on my doorstep that froze my body. The message said that if I ever left that job, me and my whole family would disappear. Those few words were enough to scare me to death. I decided it was too dangerous to leave. I didn't know what these people were capable of, so I just asked to move to the morning shift. At first, I thought this would make them angry, but when I didn't receive any other messages, I thought not. To this day, I still wonder why they didn't let me leave. I guess maybe they wanted to keep me around to control me, or maybe they have some plan to hurt me when the time is right. The only thing I know is that the best thing I can do is to stay quiet and not talk about this with anyone, as I don't know if a friendly partner I can tell is really one of them in hiding. I am Kelly, a 21-year-old woman who used to be a content creator on OnlyFans. 
I would like to share a dark memory of mine with you. This happened about three months ago. I, as an OnlyFans user, used to share my pictures that would appeal to those who would appreciate the beauty of a naked body. Three months ago, I was mostly sharing these kinds of pictures and sometimes videos of me on the platform. The profit I was gaining was decent enough for me to keep on posting the kind of content that I would post, but with a desire to earn more, I started to meet with my fans. The ones that supported me the most financially could spend more to spend a night with me. Of course, as a person who was aware of the dangers of such meetings, I decided to contact a friend of mine. His name was Nick, and he was a very muscular guy who was trained in different martial arts. Before I started to go to these meetings, I made a deal with this friend of mine. Whenever I went to one of my supporters' houses, I would spend two hours, and after two hours, I would call Nick. If he could not hear from me, he would assume the worst and arrive at the address that I gave him. He was my personal bodyguard, as you can understand. As part of our deal, I would pay 20% of my profit to him. Three months ago, I received another invitation from one of my OnlyFans supporters. I started a chat with the guy. His name was Robert. He did not seem like the chatty type. He was more into sending pictures of his genitalia. At first, I was not sure to meet him, so I did not respond to his messages. But another text that came from him revealed something marvelous. His financial status. He sent a picture of his bank account, and the amount of money he had in that account was insane. I can pay you more than you can ever imagine, he texted. The next text was his address. I was charmed to see a fan of mine was so eager to see me. That is why I accepted his offer. I contacted Nick, as usual, sending him the address of Robert and the details such as the time and date of our meeting. He said that he was sick, but he had a friend who would gladly help me. His friend's name was James, and he was a guy he met from the Muay Thai classes he was attending. Nick said that he would send my phone number and the other details to James, and he sent me his phone number. A day later, I got into a cab and went to the address Robert gave me. When I arrived there, I was surprised to see a very mediocre house. I assumed that even though Robert was a rich guy, he was pursuing a humble lifestyle. With hesitation, I knocked on his door. The wooden door opened very slowly with creaking sounds. There stood a young man, dressed sharply, looking more handsome than most of my other fans. He had green eyes and black hair. With a little sincere smile on his face, he hugged me and he said, Oh, you must be Kelly. Robert is waiting for you in the bedroom. Realizing that this man was not Robert, I was quite disappointed. Can you show me the bedroom? I asked the cute gentleman. He leads me to the bedroom on the second floor right away. He opened the door and there laid an older man in his 60s. He had white thin hair with dozens of wrinkles on his face. His skin resembled a corpse. When he saw me enter the room, his eyes blazed with infernal pleasure. He looked at me as a drop of saliva fell down from his mouth. Hello, Kelly. I am Robert, your biggest fan, said the old man as he smiled maniacally. I did not want to have intercourse with this man. I turned back, and as I tried to leave the room, the other man pushed me in and closed the door. I tried to open it in a panic, but could not. I could hear him locking the door. I started to scream and cry for help. Robert started to speak. Look, there is no one that can help you right now. Nobody can hear your screams, and if you try to resist or hurt me, my son will burst into this room and murder you. Let's just have fun, and then you can have your money and leave. What shocked me the most was the fact that the young man who led me to Robert's room was none other than his son. What kind of twisted family was this? Unfortunately, Robert was right, and I had no choice but to let him have his pleasure. I stopped trying to open the door and turned around. As I looked at him with anger, I started to take my clothes off. That's my girl, he said as he laughed. When I was taking my clothes off, I tried to find my phone and dial James, but I could not find my phone anywhere. Then I understood what happened. Robert's son must have taken it from my pocket when he hugged me. I was really frustrated and feeling hopeless. 
The only thing I could do was to wait for two hours so that James could understand that there was something wrong and come here. I tried my best to stall Robert and gain more time. Robert seemed to be frustrated at first, but when I told him that it was part of foreplay, he appeared relaxed. I ran around the room telling him to catch me. I hid under his bed. I made my makeup over and over again. I did all of this while giggling, making it look like I was trying to tease him, but in fact, I was just trying to gain more time. After a moment, he got tired of it and demanded me to lay down. I laid on the bed, and as he approached my body, I asked to go to the bathroom. He told me that he could not wait anymore as he held me by my wrists. I tried my best to free myself from his grip. He was a lot stronger for an old man. After minutes of struggling that felt like hours, I managed to free myself and instinctively hit him. He angrily shouted for help, and his son burst into the room. He grabbed me and held me down. I tried to fight back, but I could not. While we were struggling, my phone fell from the man's pocket and landed right next to me. I don't know how, but I managed to reach to my phone and call James. The man punched me and took the phone away from me. As he did that, I heard the ringing of another phone. The man looked at me and started to laugh as he took his phone from his pocket. I understood the messed up reality of the situation I was in at that moment. The young man who was fighting me was James. He threw my phone away as he continued to laugh and held me down. He pressed his huge hands on my neck. With the feeling of utter betrayal and desperation, I tried to find a way out of this hellish place I was in. At that point, I saw two things. The first thing I saw was the huge window of the room, and the second thing was one of my heels next to me. With the last drain of my strength, I reached for my heel. I grabbed it and shoved it into James' eye. He grunted in pain, and I pushed him off of me. I ran towards the window and jumped through it. The glass shattered as I went through it, and lots of pieces of it cut my body. I escaped that place while bleeding. When I arrived at the house of another friend of mine, I told her what happened. We called the police and gave them every detail. At first, I was hesitant to call Nick, but then I decided to call him and I told him what kind of devilish person James really was. He was as shocked as I was. He told me that he would help me with the investigation process and give every information he had about James to the police. James and Robert were caught by the police yesterday, and it makes me really happy to know that these monsters are going to jail, but what I had to go through left a scar that I must never forget. I stopped using OnlyFans after that incident, as it was a website once I enjoyed using, but now, something I kept having nightmares about. Hi, I'm Simon. I live in an amazing apartment building in downtown Los Angeles. In my building, we like to think of ourselves as family. Recently, the couple who lived across from me just moved out. We were sad to see them go, but you can't beat the upgrade of a house. So we were happy for them. The apartment was only vacant for a week before a new tenant was moving in. I had the day off from work and noticed the new tenant was a very attractive woman. I approached her with a charming smile and held out my hand for her to shake. You must be the new tenant. I'm Simon. I live across from you. She flashed a charming smile of her own and shook my hand. I'm Jenny. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Jenny. Do you need some help moving in? I have the day off work and don't have any plans. Oh, sure. I'd like that. I do have a friend helping me, but we could use extra hands. She said, tucking her brown hair behind her ear. I noticed a blonde girl coming out of the elevator with a dolly of boxes. And here she is. Jenny beamed. Simon, this is my friend Nicole. Nicole, this is my neighbor Simon. Are you two moving in together? I asked. Nicole shook her head. Oh, God, no. Jenny and I learned that we can't live together. That's why she's moving here. I see. Sometimes it just doesn't work out with some people. I shrugged. All the same, I'm offering to lend a hand. Sure. Nicole smiled. Great, I said and helped them move in some heavy boxes. A few other tenants I know well pitched in and helped. 
Some of the guys helped me get our furniture in, and we put our bed frame together. It was dinner time by the time we were all done. Let me buy everyone pizza, Jenny insisted. All this would have taken Nicole and me days. You don't have to pay for all our pizza. Let's order some and we'll all pitch in, I told her. We all agreed to help pay for the pizza to feed all of us. Wow, that's so nice of everyone. Jenny smiled sweetly. Usually, people just take the offer. We're not that kind of folk around here. Here at the complex, we like to think of ourselves as family, I said proudly. All of the other tenants nodded in agreement. The pizza was ordered, and we all enjoyed it. As the days went by, I found myself thinking about Jenny a lot and really wanted to get to know her. She was so sexy and the sweetest girl. She was one who was easily out of my league, but I had to try anyway. To my surprise, she seemed to show the same interest in me. She seemed lonely since moving in. Before I knew it, a couple of months had gone by, and Jenny and I were hanging out a lot. I noticed Nicole hadn't really come around since she helped her move in. Jenny didn't really have any guests either. Other than myself, she didn't really bother with getting to know the others around here. We were all okay with it, as she was clearly an introvert in a building of extroverted people. It was an unspoken, unanimous decision to let her come around when she wanted. One day, she came into the building hauling a lot of groceries, and I had just come from a run. Hi, Jenny, I said with a bit of flirtation in my voice. Hi, Simon. She smiled and struggled to push the elevator button. Here, let me help you, I said as I pushed the button for her. Let me take some of those off your hands, too, I offered. Thank you, she said sweetly and handed a few bags over to me. Would you like some help putting them away, too? I asked. She bit her lip, and it was so damn cute. That would be nice. Thank you, Simon. Shit. The way she said my name was so innocent, and yet it made my blood go straight to my pants. It made me wonder if she did that on purpose. Either way, she got to me. She opened the door to her apartment, and I followed her inside, closing the door with my foot. Her phone chimed, and she set the bags down and pulled it from her purse. <sighs> Nicole just canceled on me again. She sighed. I frowned a bit, watching her. Canceled? I've been trying to cook dinner for her as an apology. She keeps canceling on me. Jenny frowned. It's none of my business, so you don't have to answer, but what are you apologizing for? I asked. We just had a fight after I moved in. I said some terrible things. We all say things out of anger that we shouldn't. I know, but... Nicole is my best friend of six years, and I just wanted to say I'm sorry. I guess she's not ready to forgive me. I didn't know what to say or how to comfort her. Well, since you helped me inside, can I cook dinner for you? She asked, batting her lashes ever so slightly. How about I help you cook and we can both enjoy the fruits of the labor? I grinned. She laughed, and I felt my pants tighten. Do you even know how to cook? I'm no Gordon Ramsay, but I can put something in a pan and make it edible. I chuckled. So you'll be on cheese grating and onion chopping duty, she winked. One of these days I'll cook for you and you can see I'm not so bad. But since it's your place and your dinner, your wish is my command, I winked. We made enchiladas that night and enjoyed some wine with our dinner. I must have had enough to give me the courage to kiss her while we sat on the couch chatting. She kissed me back and crawled on my lap. We sat there, making out, and I let her know that I wanted her. Next thing I knew, we were in the bedroom, and I had the best sex of my life. We fell asleep together. I woke up some time in the night, needing to pee, but I found myself unable to move. I blinked to clear my vision and found myself bound to the bedpost and my legs tied together. Jenny wasn't anywhere on the bed. I struggled against my restraints, and Jenny came in the room with a cleaver. Jenny, what are you doing? I asked, trying to hide the fear in my voice. She said nothing, but opened the closet door. She pulled a bunch of thick plastic off something, the kind of heavy-duty plastic they pack mattresses in. An awful smell hit me, 
and I looked in horror as I saw her friend Nicole's lifeless body. Her face looked bludgeoned, and her limbs were all dislocated. I don't know how to make her forgive me, Jenny said as she brushed the hair from Nicole's face tenderly. Uh, Jenny, she can't because she's dead. No, she's not, Jenny yelled and looked at me with piercing eyes. I just put her in a deep sleep. What are you going to do with me? I asked, trying to sound more curious than frightened. I'm going to put you in a deep sleep so you can be with her. I know she wanted you. I saw the way she looked at you on move-in day. I like you, Simon, but I did a bad thing to my friend, and now I owe her, Jenny said as she stood up and walked to the bed with the cleaver. I fought against my restraints. Jenny, you don't have to do this. I can help you. I hollered in protest. But she ignored me as she straddled me. I writhed beneath her trying to get her off me, but due to my restraints, she only bounced on top of me. She went to strike me, but I managed to bounce her enough that she missed my throat, and by some stroke of luck, she cut one of my hands loose. I shoved her off me as hard as I could, and she fell on the floor. The cleaver was stuck into the bedpost, and I grabbed it, using it to free my other hand. She came at me, and I waved it at her. She backed off and I managed to get on my knees and I grabbed her and banged it against the dresser and knocked her out. Police came and it turned out Jenny and Nicole were best friends. But there was something wrong with Jenny. Nicole told her to move out or she would put her in a hospital. The complex family remains strong, but we don't get close with newcomers anymore. Hey, I am Stacy. Today was my very first day of university in a new city. I was very excited and at the same time a bit nervous as I was about to stay away from my family for the prime time. I settled myself in the hostel room and straightforwardly went to my university. The vibe of the university was phenomenal. I had already made two friends from my class, Rose and Stella. It was all good until I noticed a guy looking at me. I recalled that he was even present at the bus stop in the morning. It was very unusual. A few minutes later, he entered the classroom and sat beside me. I decided to ignore him so that he would stop gawking at me. At least, that's what I believed. After the first lecture was over, he took off from the class. I won't lie, I was relaxed. The entire day was exhausting. It was about 6.30 in the evening, and I was waiting for the bus to come to reach the hostel on time. It was too cold over there as the winter was at its peak. Suddenly, I realized there was a hand behind me touching my shoulders. I immediately turned back, and I saw him. He was standing so close to me that I could feel his smell. He scented as he had not taken a bath in years. Deep, dark circles with messy hair surrounding his eyes. I immediately stepped back and asked him, what do you want? He said he was just trying to protect me from this harsh, cold climate. I said, thanks, I could take care of myself, so don't worry. His eyes turned red the moment I said this, and I won't lie, chills went down my spine. But unexpectedly, he began to smile and said, Of course, you could take care of yourself, but the world is too dark. Just be careful. And started coming close to me. But fortunately, the bus arrived precisely at that moment and ran towards the bus. I was eased the minute I entered the bus. After entering my hostel room, I locked it carefully and went to bed. I immediately fell asleep as I was too exhausted. I suddenly woke up at around 1 o'clock in the night. My throat was dry, so I got up and switched on the light to drink water on the table. As soon as I picked up the bottle, my senses flew. I could not believe what I saw. I saw the man in my window looking at me with his hungry eyes from outside of the window. That bottle fell out of my hand and I wanted to shout very loudly, but I could not cry. It seemed that I had frozen. I worked with great courage and started calling. My shouting caused a stir. That man started trying to break the glass in my window after seeing me screaming. The moment he broke the glass, 
the police arrived. He tried to escape but wasn't successful. A few days after, the police called me. I learned he was a serial killer and rapist who had already killed three girls before me in different cities. It's been a while since then, but still, I get nightmares about that creepy guy. Hi, this is Alex Carson. I'm 45 years old now, and I live with my father, Adam. A horrible incident took place when I was only 27 years old. I started working at a company as an accountant. I was pleased with my father. I loved him very much, and he used to take care of me really well. But for a few years, he started drinking more and more alcohol. And due to his drinking, he got divorced from my mother. She left us. Many years passed after the divorce. I used to go to the office with my friend Ryan, who was the same age as me. He was my best friend. We used to leave for the office on the same bus every day. We used to come home from the office every day at 10 at night. Ryan said, Come on, Alex, let's go. It's our stop. We gotta get off. Yeah, man, I'm coming. I know, we're late today. Anyways. My work was going well, but after some time, a horrible incident was going to happen to me, which I had not ever imagined. So one night, when I was returning home, sitting on the bus, I saw a girl. She had boarded the bus at the next stop. She was staring at me continuously. That day, Ryan took off from the office. I looked at the girl and smiled. But the girl didn't give any reaction. She was just silent, kept staring at me. Suddenly, her eyes turned completely pale. When I went towards her to check out, the girl pulled down the window and jumped out from the bus. No, no, somebody help that girl. The crazy thing was that I was screaming for help so loudly, but no one sitting on the bus was taking this matter seriously. Nobody was even saying anything. I reported the incident to the police, but I didn't have a picture of the girl, so the police also didn't get any clues in the matter. After that incident, I was disturbed. Ryan said, Dude, you maybe had a bad dream, just a long day at work. I wouldn't worry about it anymore, man. Just stay cool. From that day onwards, I was having the strangest dreams. In my dream, I saw a man that brutally killed many people with a knife. I had a lot of office work, and that's why I couldn't concentrate much on any of my work. Similarly, when I returned from the office, a hazardous accident happened to me. A man was sitting in the bus's front seat. He had boarded the bus at the same stop where the girl had boarded. The man looked very creepy and strange. After a while, the man got up and started looking at me strangely. I thought maybe he knew me, but there was nothing like that. Suddenly, the color of his body turned blue and pale. He started breathing heavily. <sighs> at that time, my body was completely loose and I was not in a condition to say anything. I was numb and frozen. I saw that the body parts of the man were chopped by themselves and they fell on the floor of the bus. There was blood everywhere. He fainted. Ryan said, Hey, what happened, Alex? Open your eyes. You've been lying on this bus for a long time. Dude, it's 9 a.m. the next day. The boss is going to kill us. Oh, did you see that? That man? Who? The entire bus is empty. There's no one else here except for us two. What happened to you, man? I think you need to see a psychiatrist. I think you're just a little disturbed because of your father, man. What the hell are you saying, Ryan? I thought maybe he was right. But even after meeting a psychiatrist, there was no effect. Since my mother left my dad, he continued to drink more and more, due to which he couldn't come to the house sometimes. Sometimes he'd be gone for several days. He even left his job. My dad said, Son, you don't know its value. It relaxes our mind. I need it. Just go to work. One day after that strange incident, me and my friends jumped on the bus. The next stop was about to come. This is that same stop where the girl and that unknown man got on the bus and again, I started to get scared. I thought that maybe this time, something crazy might not happen and that it was finally over. This time, four people got onto the bus. They were all friends. 
They were talking to each other and seemed very happy. Thank God it was all normal. But after a while, their expressions changed. Their eyes turned completely red. They all started moving towards Ryan. Ryan was just sitting there reading a magazine. I yelled, Ryan, stop reading. Can't you see them? Dude, who? He couldn't see the spirits. Yes, I realize now they were spirits. All the spirits were visible only to me, but I didn't know the reason why I could see them. Suddenly, all four spirits entered Ryan's body. They went through his mouth, and it looked like smoke was going inside his mouth. I was creeped out. After that, Ryan was fully possessed. He started speaking loudly in the voice of a woman. I will kill your father soon! After that, Ryan's head automatically turned backwards, and he died right there and then. I informed the police. The police didn't find any evidence. I was distraught. My father didn't come home for four days. I searched for my father, but I couldn't find him anywhere, and I thought I'd find out the truth. So after the office one day, I again boarded the same bus to come home. I had to get to the bottom of this. When I got on the bus, the same bus stop came, and this time, a couple got on the bus. They seemed regular, happy, but I wasn't falling for this stuff again. Soon their attitude changed, and they both came towards me. The couple started grabbing my hand. I was in a lot of pain. I started screaming. By the grace of God, the second the bus stop came, my father got on the bus. Dad, help! Later, I realized that this was no ordinary bus. The passengers sitting in it were also no ordinary people. My father said, You guys ruined my life, but didn't ruin my son's life. Since when do you guys come into my dreams and scare me? But now, you do this to my son? You guys took my life. I'm begging you. Son. Listen, this is what happened. There was a friend of mine. He was the bus driver. I used to get very jealous of him because he was delighted in life. And me, I was so sad. I mixed sedation in his drink one day. Because of that drug, he and all the passengers sitting in the bus had an accident and died on the spot. All these souls still haunt me to this day. It's why I can't stop drinking. Suddenly, all the spirits surrounded my father. Before I could say anything, those spirits built a wall and seemed like they just ventured into another world through that wall. The next day, my father's dead body was found in the river near that bus stop. The police never got to know the reason for his death, and from that day onwards, nothing wrong ever happened to me again. My hey, this is Jonathan. I'm 30 years old now. So, this horrible incident took place when I was working at McDonald's. At the time, I was 25. Newton, Ashley, Ellison, and Mark were my staff members. Ellison was married and had one baby boy of five years. They were very nice and hardworking people at McDonald's. We were all very good friends of each other and used to work together. But Mark was a little short-tempered. He used to get angry at very little things, but he was good at heart. Everything went well for a long time, but the day was coming soon, which was going to bring darkness into our lives. One day, police arrived at the McDonald's. It was the crime spot. It was dark at the time. There was no light. All the goods in the shop were scattered here, there, and everywhere, and some belongings were totally broken. On seeing it, it seemed to be just a case of a typical robbery. But it was not a case of looting. It was more sinister than that. Come on, soldiers, go ahead. On moving forward, they found me unconscious and there was Ellison's dead body in the freezer. Someone had brutally killed her, firstly murdered and strangled her, and choked later. They found Ashley in the bathroom. She was lying there in very bad condition. She was about to die. Her throat was bleeding profusely because the murderer had stabbed him in the throat with a fork several times. She wasn't dead, but she was not able to speak or say anything. She was bleeding profusely from her mouth also. The murderer had shown no mercy at all before killing these two. Mark was also lying unconscious there. He was also hit very hard on the head and had a cut on his chest. He was bleeding also. We were taken to the hospital. 
I was completely blown away knowing the truth about this horrible incident. I had no idea who would have done all that. Police officer Andrew called me to the police station for interrogation. Ashley and Mark did not regain consciousness because their situation was critical. So I was in the police station. Andrew said, Do you remember anything about what happened that night? No, sir. I didn't see his face. Tell me what you remember of the night. Well, it was around 11 at night. At the time, someone cut off the light at McDonald's and it became dark everywhere. I heard a very loud noise coming from the bathroom, and it was Ashley's. I was worried and turned on the torch and headed towards the bathroom. I opened the bathroom's door. I was shocked and terrified seeing her. Ashley was screaming and suffering in pain. Help, Anthony! Oh my god, Ashley, don't worry. Before I could save her, someone hit me so hard on the head with two big glass bottles. I was bleeding and started screaming and I ran in the same condition to save my life in another room. I was lucky that day that you came on time. Otherwise, I would not have survived, sir. Okay, thanks. It'll be helpful. Sir, do you know who's behind all this? No, nothing's known yet, but we suspect some people. Okay, you rest. If you remember anything else, you let us know, okay? After a few days... Ashley's life could not be saved, and she died. Mark, however, regained consciousness. The police interrogated him, but nothing was known from him as to who was behind all that. I saw he had become very weak. A few days passed like that, and nothing was found in the hands of the police. Then, after some time, the time came when the mystery was about to be revealed or opened in front of everyone. After one month, Mark and I started going back to work at McDonald's. The police were suspicious of both of us. That's why they forbade us to go out of the city. But one day, I overheard him talking to a guy on a call in McDonald's. Mark said, Just once I get a chance, I'll run away with the money. Don't worry, brother. As soon as I heard all these things, I immediately called the police and told them everything. He saw me calling the police and started throttling me. What? Why are you doing this? Leave me, please. Mark said, You will tell everything to the police? Huh? Fortunately, the police arrived and caught him. And the main culprit was Mark. I couldn't believe it. After a few days, he did confess to his crime. Officer Andrew said, I've got all the evidence against you. We know you loved Ellison. Many people have seen you and her together. So you tell me the whole thing from the start. Mark said, Yes, yes, I did all that. I wanted to be a very rich man since I was a child, but I never could. That's why I did all this, to fulfill the purpose. I lured Ellison into the trap of my love because it was very easy to trap her. She had a child and was a single mother. She even helped me to kill Newton. Newton had come to know about the truth about us. That's why we had to kill him, and she helped me with this. She called him to a secluded place, and we crushed his head with a stone and killed him. She was scared after his death. She was feeling that the police would catch both of us. That's why she was repeatedly threatening me not to do the robbery, or else she'd go to the police and say everything. I tried a lot to convince her, but she was not listening to me at all. One day I had lots of arguments with her. That's why I killed her. I had to do this, otherwise... She would have told everything to you all. But how'd you make this big elaborate plan? I had made two plans that, if I become successful, then I'll run away with all the money. But I knew very well what to do if the plan did not succeed. I tried to arrange the sleeping pills, but I couldn't. So I found this plan more worthwhile. First, I went to kill Ashley. When I went to kill her, I snatched her phone, but I didn't know that she had two phones. She called the police from her other phone and my game was about to end. That's why I applied another plan. First, I hit my head with a glass and kept it there, with a cut on my hand with a chef knife and fainted. Thus, my plan could not be successful because of Ashley, and I killed her. I continued to work at McDonald's so that no one would doubt me, but eventually, I was caught because of Jonathan. I hate that guy. Seriously. If he hadn't listened to me, I wouldn't be here today. Son... You've committed such a heinous crime. Now, even God can't save you. 
And now, he's in prison. God, I hate business trips, but it's part of the job. This time it was South America. Our plane descended into what looked like a heavy cloud of mist. I wiggled around uncomfortably in my seat. I shoved my coworker Jack awake. Hey, we're landing. Jack and I were here on business, and it was both our first time in South America. His eyes were heavy looking out the window. Is that... <sighs> rain? It wasn't rain. It wasn't mist. In fact, it was the opposite. We were descending into a cloud of dust that stretched hundreds of miles, as far as my eyes could see. Welcome to Aricha, Chile, announced the pilot. Where the local time is. Jack and I weren't listening. Our eyes were fixated on what was outside the window. The plane penetrated the dust cloud, where we couldn't see more than a few feet outside the window. I couldn't help but wonder how the pilot could even land in these conditions. The plane landed safely despite my worries. We exited the plane and collected our luggage. As we set foot outside the airport, Jack and I stood in awe. Before us was a busy town. Cars zoomed by, pedestrians hurried, and families walked the streets joyously. However, a thin layer of dust fogged everything, as if a filter was being applied to our scope of vision. Everything looked foggy, and no one seemed to care. We waved a taxi down. Hey, what are a pair of Americanos doing in Aricha? Asked the taxi driver in a cheerfully and friendly tone. We're here on business, Jack said matter-of-factly. I sat in silence observing the outdoors. We drove through deserted fields of weeds and dry roots that were covered by a thin layer of dust. What might have been a luscious image of green life and vegetation at some point in the past was now a scene no different than that of a desert where the only signs of life were occasional stumps and tumbleweed riding air currents. Has it always been this... dry? I asked. Oh no, he said in a jolly tone. You all don't know? He glanced back at me. It hasn't rained in Aricha in what? 121 weeks now. It's the longest drought in Chilean history. He continued, but my attention gravitated towards the growing desert outside. When we arrived at our hotel... We learned that the hotel didn't exist. Instead, we were greeted with the knowledge that we were staying in a dilapidated hostel down the road, where we were scheduled to have our business meeting. The hostel consisted of a lobby area and three rooms, two of which were empty. The inside was equally as battered as the outside, and everything inside was just as dusty. Our room consisted of two stiff beds, an old wooden table that seemed to be waiting for an excuse to fall apart a non-working television, and an AC unit that rumbled wildly. We placed our luggage on the bed, causing it to creak. Just then, I noticed the caretaker of the hostel. A short old lady shining a smirk at me stood at the door. Her smile seemed to extend from ear to ear, exposing cracked yellow teeth. Her eyebrows were raised as if anticipating something. She stood there, face unmoving. Just her sight made me shiver. I raised my hand slowly and awkwardly in acknowledgement. She stared, expression unchanged for about 45 seconds, and walked away without saying a word. Jack and I unpacked and had perhaps what was the most uncomfortable night's sleep ever. The next morning, we dressed with our best attire, that had already collected dust, and walked down the street to our business meeting. Good morning, said the short balding man as he shook my hand. We stood at the entrance of his office. Good morning, nice to meet... I said shaking his hand but was interrupted mid-sentence. We are no longer interested in your services, he said shortly. He began to walk back into his office. I stood confused. Jack intervened. Sir, if we could only have a few minutes of your time... The man repeated himself sharply. We are no longer interested in your services. Goodbye. The door shut in our face. Jack and I looked at each other and shrugged. We traveled all this way for this? The sun began to set and we returned to the hostel. Well, that was a complete and total waste of time, I said to Jack, removing my tie and throwing it on our hostel bed. 
Let's catch an early flight tomorrow and get out of this godforsaken place. Yeah, he nodded in agreement, and we began packing our things. Just then, a knock came at the door. That same caretaker stood at the door, wearing the same smirk and elevated eyebrows. It's time, she croaked. Huh? questioned Jack. It's time, she repeated. Ma'am, I began in a rather impatient tone. We don't want... She interrupted by repeating herself again. Jack, the more patient of the two of us, decided to indulge her. All right, it's time for what? He said in a soft tone often used towards the elderly. She led him to the lobby and I continued packing. I placed my last shirt in my suitcase when chanting erupted from the lobby. Followed by Jack screaming obscenities, my stomach tensed and I rushed to see what was causing the commotion. The worn down room that was the lobby was now void of any furniture. Along the walls hung hundreds of small candles, flickering sporadically, illuminating seven women who stood along the perimeter of the room. Each woman wore a black cloak that reached beyond their feet. They each wore identical masks that resembled a bird's face. It had sharp slits for eyes and a protruding beak. Long colorful feathers stood on the back of their heads. They chanted in unison. Jack stood at the center of the empty room, seven pairs of eyes on him. Good, you're here, said the caretaker pushing me to the center of the room. As I joined Jack, the seven mass women spread evenly around the room, covering all exits and room entrances. For three hundred years, began the caretaker in a thundering voice. Shuck, god of rain, has blessed our beautiful village. And for over three hundred years, our village has flourished and thrived. The chanting by the other six mass women intensified. They stood motionless, though their shadows swayed as the candles flickered. But sadly, my people have angered Shark. We have lost our way, and the God of Rain has turned his back on us. Her head hung low in disappointment. But the legends are clear. To regain the grace of Shark and bring life to our village again, the God requests blood. This drought must end now. Jack looked at me. He was sweating profusely. Look, ladies, you have the wrong guys here. We just want to get home. So if you could just excuse us, began Jack walking toward the exit. As he approached the exit, one of the masked women broke her stillness, summoned a knife from within her robe, and plunged it deep into Jack's upper thigh. He howled in pain, dropping to the ground. Blood began to pour around his body, mixing the layer of dust on the ground, creating a thick and viscous substance. I ran toward him, but three of the masked bodies jumped forward, obstructing my path. You mustn't help him, said the leader monotonously. He has been chosen by Shaq, and now you must end it, she said flatly. She approached me and presented a large ceremonial dagger. The leather handle was engraved with symbols I couldn't recognize. Now you must end it, she repeated. The bodies that stood between Jack and me cleared. Jack was laying on the ground, dagger deep in his thigh. The pool of blood had grown into an ocean. He was pale and struggled to keep his eyes open. I stood incapable of comprehending what had occurred in the last few minutes. The candles continued to flicker widely. A stabbing pain in my own arm grounded me back to reality. One of the seven had stabbed my arm. Though softly, as if to nudge me forward, I stepped closer to Jack. I... I can't, I repeated inaudibly. An excruciating pain erupted in my arm. One of the seven had plunged a knife deep into my shoulder now. You must. By then, Jack was unconscious. I told myself he was dead from blood loss, but I know that was a lie that I used to convince myself. The seven tightened the perimeter, forcing me closer to Jack. They now each threatened with a knife in my direction. They were now inches away from my body. The seven deadly weapons reflected the candlelight and threatened my life. I picked up the ceremonial dagger. I did what I needed to do. The next few hours were a blur. Vague and foggy images remain in my mind of the seven dragging Jack's body away. What they did with it, I don't know and I don't want to know. I grabbed my backpack leaving behind my luggage and began mindlessly walking to the airport. As I left the hostel, the chanting intensified. I walked and walked for hours on the dusty road. I don't remember arriving to the airport, 
I don't remember boarding the plane. The one thing I do remember is looking out the airplane window as we departed and seeing flashes of lightning throughout the dark rain clouds that gathered over Aricha. Hi, my name's Carter. It's my birthday today. I know this is a very special day, but I'm remembering a horrible time in my life. On this same day, my birthday, a horrible incident took place in the year of 1997. My three friends Natasha, Jonas, and Tina were with me. We were all going to our friend Samantha's home. Samantha was our new friend. We met her at an event in England. She was a nice and sweet girl, and she became our close friend really quickly. So one day, Samantha came and told us and invited us to her father's birthday, Mr. Garmin. We were happy for her father, and we all at once got ready for her father's birthday. She had come with a large and beautiful car. We all sat in the car and left for the house together. After covering about 10 minutes, we all noticed that Samantha suddenly drove the car in the opposite direction of the location. We all started wondering, so we asked her about it. We had organized a party there, in another location. Hearing these words from her mouth, we all sat calm. When we reached the location, we were totally shocked because that place was nothing but an abandoned hostel. Natasha said, Hey Samantha, is this the place where you have organized the party? But this place is looking very strange. Samantha got angry and said, Shut up! This place is very close to me. You know nothing, Natasha. After saying that, she kind of started to act normal. Samantha said that her family was very unique and they always used to plan for some adventurous tasks. That's why she had decided to celebrate her father's birthday in this abandoned hostel. Natasha and I were skeptical about Samantha's behavior, but we ignored it. We didn't really want to spoil the celebration. So when we got there, Samantha took us inside the hostel. We all noticed a very weird and creepy environment there. We saw everything was lying here, there, everywhere cracked walls and ruined old rooms. Suddenly, we heard a voice. Dum, dum. We turned back and saw the main door had been completely locked. Everyone started screaming for help. And while this happened, we noticed Samantha was not there. I said, Samantha, are you here? Somebody open this door. Stop playing with us. And suddenly, we all smelt a weird gas and all fainted at once. I knew someone let out that gas intentionally. When I woke up, I found myself in a dark room. Later, I came to know that I was trapped completely in that room. I was terrified and wondering what would happen next. I could literally have died from anxiety at that time. After a few seconds, I heard instructions from a microphone, and I came to know that someone was monitoring me the whole time. The man's voice on the mic said that the room is going to be filled with water in 10 minutes and I had to accomplish a certain task in that given time. At first, I thought it was just a game, but I later realized this was all planned. That voice came again. You have only 10 minutes to get out of this room, or else you will drown here and die. There's a table on your left side. On the table there is a box. This box is made specially for you. Go and open it and get your door keys. Suddenly, the room started filling slowly with water. When I reached the box, I remembered what he had said to me. I was sure that the box, though, was not a normal box. That's why I carefully inserted my hand into the box. When I did, I got a very strong electric shock. I was terrified and didn't even have a second to decide anything that time. My feet were starting to sink. I forcefully entered my hand and suffered the painful electric shock for one whole minute. Never have I felt anything like this. I was screaming in pain. Even thinking about it and remembering that horrible day, I still feel the pain. I was confused, but I only had a few minutes left. By the grace of God, I got the key and escaped from the room. When I got out, I found Tina in the next room. I was in for another shock. Oh my God! I saw that Tina's head was separated from her body. It seemed like someone had brutally slit her throat just a few minutes before. There was blood and sharp old blooded tools everywhere. I was very horrified and frightened. Just seeing that painful scene, I started vomiting and felt dizzy. I'd never seen anything like that in my life except in the movies. Next I started looking for Natasha and Jonas. Suddenly, 
I heard Natasha's screaming voice which was coming from another room. I slowly went into the room to help her. I saw a man who was wearing a weird pig face mask. He was about to put a hot rod in Natasha's eyes. I at once picked up a sharp knife from the table and stabbed him on the back. Ah, I'll cut you! The masked man screamed. Even though I stabbed him, the masked man didn't stop. He was trying to harm us even though he was injured. I struggled hard to snatch the rod, but he was very strong. I was lucky that day. As soon as I got the chance, I pushed him into the walls with great force. I inserted that iron rod in his stomach and pushed the rod several times until he died. We ran away from that room and started looking for Jonas. We couldn't find him anywhere. Wandering here and there for what seemed like a long time, both Natasha and I reached a room where we noticed a lot of newspaper cutting and magazines. Natasha saw her father's picture there. She was shocked. Who was that? Who had been collecting these articles? When we explored that room, we found more articles. We found a newspaper in which three people's pictures were printed. They were Natasha's dad, Tina's dad, and Jonas's dad. Somebody had crossed their faces with red marker in the printed picture, and the room wall was totally ruined with several marks and names. Everywhere, we could see the words written, Revenge and Mom. Natasha noticed a hidden newspaper cutting below a table. When we read it, we were totally shocked. According to that article, those three people, Natasha's dad, Tina's dad, and Jonas's dad, were those persons who had revealed the secret of Mr. Garmin, Samantha's father. Obviously, Mr. Garmin was a very bad man. He used to sell the body of organs of kids. Natasha, Jonas, and Tina's father had revealed his face in front of the whole media. Samantha was only 12 years old at the time, and she loved her mother so much. But her mother hung herself with rope due to defamation and pure guilt. When all that happened, Samantha had decided that she would harm their family too. We heard someone's footsteps, and it was Jonas. He was badly injured. We at once informed the police. As we were moving out, we saw the pig-faced mask person came again, and he removed his mask. And then Samantha also came out from a door with a big knife in her hand. Both were looking psycho. They intended to kill us and were laughing evilly. That man was Mr. Garmin. Suddenly, Samantha threw the knife at Jonas, hitting his chest. He fell down and died. We both ran as fast as we could and locked in a room. Both daughter and father were banging on the door. Somehow they broke down the door. They were about to attack and kill us, but then the police showed up, and shots rang out. They arrested them for Tina and Jonas's murder. We left, thank God, and we will forever mourn the loss of our two friends. My name is Samantha. I am a 19-year-old college student. My boyfriend, Eric, and our couple friends, Julie and Felix, went to Dublin, Ireland for spring break. We wanted to explore haunted, abandoned buildings. The U.S. has some sinister locations, but Europe is a cesspool of hauntings. We aren't professional ghost hunters. We don't try to make contact, but we do like exploring the abandoned places. We have had some chilling experiences, and in a strange way, it leaves us wanting more. We found out about this abandoned hostel on the outskirts of Dublin, and of course we had to go check it out. But little did we know, it was going to be the biggest mistake any of us have ever made. The main doors were obviously locked, but we all managed to get in through a broken window. We each took our flashlights out of our backpacks and began looking around the place. We prefer to explore at night so that we don't get caught trespassing. Not to mention, that's when spirits are most active. Eric and Felix took out their walkie-talkies and suggested we split up to cover more ground. Julie and I will explore the upstairs first, Felix said. Fine. Samantha and I will explore the first floor and the basement, Eric sighed. Eric and I went down to the basement and did a walkie-talkie test. This is Pinky, do you copy brain? Eric said into the device. The signal was a bit fuzzy, but we heard Felix reply. This is brain. Copy. Cell phone signal could be sketchy in places like this, so we rely on walkie-talkies to communicate. Eric and I were walking around the basement when we heard a muffled scream come from one of the rooms. Stay here, Eric said. Eric, don't leave me alone, I protested. I'm going to check it out. Hide in this closet and I will be right back. I got in the closet and stayed quiet. 
I heard some voices and a loud sound as though Eric had gotten hit by something hard. Take him in with the other group, one of the men said, and make sure you tie him up. If he screams, cut out his tongue. My stomach dropped and I immediately knew what happened to Eric. He had to walkie-talkie so I couldn't reach Julie and Felix. I pulled out my phone to see if I could get a signal and text them to warn them as I figured signal was dead. We were in a real pickle now. I saw some lights turn on from under the door and could see the passing shadows of footsteps. I was so scared and worried about Eric. I tried to listen for when it got quiet and I could peek out and try and find him. Just then, I heard Julie screaming from upstairs. I knew it was her because she was screaming Felix's name. Then, a bunch of footsteps came bounding down the stairs. Muffled sobbing accompanied them. I could hear both Julie and Felix's muffled protest as they walked by. I cupped my hand over my flashlight and turned it on. What I saw made me puke my guts out. Jars of dismembered body parts. There were even whole heads of people soaking in formaldehyde. I took a step back and knocked down a tray of scalpels and knocked over a chainsaw. There was a refrigerator and I don't know why, but I opened it. It was full of human meat. Just then, the door opened and the largest man I had ever seen pointed at me. We got one more, he yelled in an Irish accent. My fight or flight kicked in and I actually put up a fight. I picked up a scalpel and drove it into the man's hand that came at me. I used my flashlight to hit him over the head. I could hear Eric screaming, run Samantha. I was chased up the stairs and out on the street. I managed to get in the car before they caught me and I drove off. I found a safe spot and called the police who came just in time before they could hurt Eric and our friends. It turned out that the hostel posed as an abandoned building to attract ghost hunters and tourists who want to explore the mysteries of abandoned places. They were part of an organized crime of cannibalism and devil worship. They waited for people to start exploring before they took the tourists by surprise and cut them up alive, eat some parts, and sell others. Our little group stayed together and we all even got married. We still go on adventures but we never explored another abandoned building ever again. Dating in your 20s is supposed to be exciting. It's the time in your life when you get to figure yourself out. What you want in a partner, what turns you on and off. It's like dating in high school without supervision because everyone around you considers you an adult. Because we're in a day and age where people's eyes are drawn to their phones like magnets, no one notices who is around them anymore. All my friends had boyfriends and I was tired of the third wheel status. So, I hopped on Tinder and took my chances. I'm Alyssa, and this was my dating nightmare. I had been on Tinder for a whole three days, swiping left, swiping right. I made a few matches, but they were all looking for sex. I should have known better, but I remained optimistic that I would find someone I could connect with. Then, there was Daniel. He wasn't someone I was instantly attracted to, but he seemed generally interested in conversing with me instead of asking what my boob size was. For context, I'm a virgin. Call me a prude, but I believe sex should be with the right person and not something you give out like free samples at a grocery store. Chatting with Daniel led to an exchange of numbers and we texted for another couple of weeks. He wanted to go on a date but I told him I wanted to know him a little more first. For both our sakes, he was understanding, and after two weeks I agreed to a date. I met him at the local Olive Garden, and we smiled at each other as we approached one another. Wow, you are even more beautiful in person. Your pictures don't do you justice. Thank you. You are very handsome. Thank you for your kind words. Should we get something to eat? I'm starving. Yes, I'm dying for some lasagna. We sat down and had the best conversation. He made me laugh hysterically and my slight attraction to him grew. After three dates, he kissed me. It wasn't my first kiss, but it felt like he put real effort into kissing me and I loved that. There was something off about him, but I figured it was just my nerves. Daniel became what any girl would consider a dream boyfriend. He treated me with respect, 
paid for every date we went on. I offered to pay for some, but he refused. He made me laugh, and I was able to join my friends on group dates. We had a few disagreements, and he not once raised his voice at me. I continued to have gnawing feeling in the pit of my stomach about him, but he was so great I pushed it behind me. All seemed perfect until our six-month anniversary came up. That's when the pressure to give me to him started happening. We would watch a movie and he would try. His actions seduced me, but I wasn't ready. It didn't feel right. I decided it was time to break up with him. If I couldn't sleep with my boyfriend that I care for, is it the right kind of love? I called him and asked him to meet me at the park. Hi, Daniel. Thanks for meeting me. I hope everything's okay. I smiled at him, as though it would soften the blow of why I called him here. I wish I could say it is, but you're about to be mad at me. He raised his eyebrows with concern. Why? Did you cheat on me? Is it that damn Don Johnson wannabe that you work with? No, I just... I can't be with you anymore. What? Why? I thought things were going so well. I'm sorry, Daniel. I don't feel that way about you anymore. Alyssa, please, let's give this more of a chance. His pleas were starting to create a scene, and I was uncomfortable. For the sake of keeping up appearances, I told Daniel I would, and we could have dinner at my place that night. That night I picked up some takeout and a bottle of wine for us to enjoy. I hoped to have a calmer conversation. I was a bit worried about being alone with him in my apartment, but I needed to put my foot down and not having people staring at me like some bitch dumping her doting boyfriend. To my surprise, he apologized for his actions earlier, told me how he was just shocked and upset. He let me know how hurt he was, but respected my decision. A couple of months went by, and I started having recurring nightmares about Daniel. I would come home from work, take a long shower, and when I stepped out, Daniel would be over the toilet vomiting aggressively. He would look up at me, his face would be pale, his eyes sunk in. The smell of rotting flesh would emanate through the bathroom. I screamed at the sight of him and ran out of the bathroom. I run to my room and Daniel is crawling down the hall like some contortionist, growling like a zombie. Alyssa, why? I loved you. Then he would charge at me and bite into my leg. Then I would wake up in a cold sweat. And then I wake up to the smell of rotting flesh. I get out of bed and go to the closet, where I have Daniel wrapped in plastic and stuffed in a garment bag. Maybe it's time I finally bury him. I didn't intend on poisoning Daniel that night, but he wasn't willing to break up. He begged me to stay with him forever. So, on a whim... I decided to give him what he wanted. He's staying with me, and I don't have to be attached to him. This was, indeed, a win-win. After breaking up with my boyfriend, I tried to find some distraction. Being in a five years long relationship makes you adapt to your partner. He had become a part of my life, which caused me to adjust to him and arrange my time considering our relationship. Now that I was alone again, I felt the urge to fill the emptiness of time that I would usually spend with him. Thus, as a distraction, I focused on my career. I left my previous job and found a position where I would work harder but get rewarded with better salaries. After a couple of months, I realized that I missed the feeling of flirting with someone. I downloaded a dating app that was quite simple to use and efficient in finding the best match for, at least that is what I thought back then. I started texting with a guy named Travis. He looked very attractive and I enjoyed our conversation. We arranged a date in a small coffee shop close to where I lived. When I sat in the coffee shop for the first time, I remember feeling nervous. It was going to be the first time flirting with someone other than my ex-boyfriend since our breakup, and I feared that I might have forgotten how to flirt. My nervousness got even worse when I realized that Travis had missed our date. Even though I was devastated, 
I decided to enjoy the coffee shop, as it was a charming place. I let myself be lost in the coziness. I listened to music and read a book. I read my book for hours, but I would close my book and look at the entrance whenever a new person entered the shop, hoping to see Travis. Of course, none of them were Travis. After a while, I noticed that a fat man in his fifties was sitting at another table by himself. He would watch me whenever he thought I was not looking at him. At first, I thought he was just a man who found me attractive, but then I realized that he looked like someone I knew. At that point, I stopped reading and looked at the man for a long time. It was Travis. Not the same man in the pictures that he sent me, but it was him. After a couple of seconds of looking at this man, I understood that he was using the images from his young times on the dating app. He had told me that he was 27 years old when we were texting, but seeing him, I realized that he was at least 50. In his pictures, he looked fit and healthy, but instead, there stood a fat man. I figured that in his youth, he was this handsome man, but now, he was a person who had lost his attractiveness. At first, I felt anger toward the man because he tricked me. But then, I remembered our conversation and how much I enjoyed it. He did not look like what I thought he would look like, but his thoughts were similar to mine. He wanted the same things as I did, and he seemed like a nice person with a good heart, but a lack of confidence. At that moment, I decided to talk with him. Of course, it was not going to be a date that ended with me inviting him to my flat, but at least I could have a pleasant conversation with this man. I walked to his table and very gently asked, Are you Travis? I could see the instant fear in his eyes as I approached him. He was shocked to know that I would be the one who came. He stuttered when he tried to speak, and after confirming that he was Travis, he started to apologize for deceiving me. I pulled a chair and sat with him. After a while, his lack of confidence got restored, and he began to speak more clearly. We started to have a lovely conversation. While we were talking, he would try to flirt with me, but not seeing a positive reaction from me would make him upset and try to change the conversation. As mainly being focused on my career at the time, I started to talk about my job, and after finishing my rather long speech about how much I loved my new job, I asked what his job was. He told me that he had a very important job, but he did not want to talk about it in the coffee shop. He seemed bored of sitting there. That is why I asked him to have a walk with me. With a smile on his face, he said that he was glad to hear this and he went to pay the bill quickly. When we left the coffee shop, he said that there was a park nearby and asked if I wanted to go there. I was surprised to see him know these places even though he was not living around here. When we went to the park, he started to behave strangely, but I thought he was just nervous because of our little date. I felt sorry for this guy as his hopes of being in a relationship with me were about to be crushed. He murmured a question very silently. Do you want to know what I do for a living? I was intrigued by this question and told him that I would love to know. He was whispering at first, telling me how he was telling other people that he was a code developer, but he was a hacker who would hack into many people's bank accounts and steal their money. He said he would only steal from people who committed a crime and got away with it. Then he said, I am the good guy here. I steal from sinners, from people that have bad hearts. Being a hacker helps me in other ways as well. He paused for a moment. I could understand whether he thought he should tell me more or not. With a confident smile on his face, he continued, For example, 
It helped me to find my true love. You, Fiona, are my true love. I hacked into the system of the app to find my best match. As you can understand, their system is not efficient when finding the love of your life. I hacked into it, and I found you. For our love, I put a lot of effort into this. After that confession of his, a great sense of fear conquered my body. I had to leave. I had to run away from this creep. As I instinctively turned around to run away, he held me by my shoulders and continued his twisted speech. I found your address. I spent my days walking around this area, trying to find good places for our date. The coffee shop was the first place where we would see each other, and this empty and dark park is the first place that we will make love. He grabbed me and started to drag me into the forest side of the park. I tried to fight back, but he was a massive guy. I felt so hopeless. I started to scream, but he closed my mouth with his hand and said that no one could hear me there. He found a bush and pushed me into it. He jumped on me, and with his heavy body on me, it felt impossible even to lift a finger. As he started to unbutton my shirt, I began to cry. I do not know how, but in the darkness, I saw a stone near me. I gathered my strength and grabbed the stone. I hit him as hard as I could. I hit him on the head again and again. He grunted in pain and tried to take the stone from my hand. At that moment, I stabbed the sharp edge of the stone into his eye. He screamed and finally got off me. I sat on him and continuously hit his face with a stone. After I realized that he was unconscious, I ran to the nearest police station. I told what happened, and as the officers listened to my story, they understood who Travis was. Travis, as the police told me, was a mentally ill serial killer who had recently escaped the mental health facility he was in. He had killed six women before. He would go on different dating apps and find young women like me. He would hack into their computers, find their locations, and find a spot to rape and murder them. After giving me this information, the police sent a group to check the body, but the body of Travis was not in the park. This happened a week ago. The police are still looking for Travis. I will move out from my flat as soon as I can find a new place to live, but until then, I have to walk the streets with fear. Whenever I see the coffee shop we went to, I feel Travis's monstrous hands grasping my body. But the worst part of living a paranoid life is the times that I have to stay alone in my house. I can still hear his disgusting breathing and panting sounds whenever I lay down. Hello, my name is Anderson. Now I'm 29. Today I'm going to tell you about a terrible story that happened to me when I worked at a huge Walmart. This incident happened to me about four years back in the huge Walmart shopping store. I had many co-workers who were very good and well-behaved. There were two girls and three boys. One of them, Sebastian, was my good friend. I got on very well with everyone. Four years back in the Walmart store, Sebastian seemed very upset for a few days. When I used to talk to him about it, he was always afraid to tell me even a little what was wrong. After asking a lot, he told me one day. He said, Man, I've made a huge mistake. I shouldn't have done that. There's no more happiness for me. Whoa, whoa, Sebastian. What are you saying? You okay? Work hard and make your life. Don't talk like that, man. That day I saw something in his hand, but he was hiding it, trying to conceal it. I couldn't see it, and he went without replying to me. The next day there was a huge uproar at the Walmart. When I asked my coworker, I found out that Sebastian had died in a truck accident. I couldn't believe it. Perhaps he deliberately dove in front of the truck? 
I suspected he could have been suicidal. Everything was going well in the Walmart store, but after a few days, some horror incidents started happening there. I couldn't believe it at first, but when an incident happened to me, I was shocked and afraid completely. So one day when I was busy in the billing process and scanning barcodes of products bought by a family, the family was standing in the queue for the billing. The age of the man was about 29 years old, and the age of the woman was about 25 also. When they were standing in the queue, I saw a kid of about eight standing behind them. That family started going out of the shop with their belongings. I shouted from behind and called them. The lady said, Hey, what are you talking about? No, we don't even have children. So how did the child come here? He must be someone else's son. Go check carefully. I also thought that maybe he was someone else's child. So I followed him. He went on and on, first floor, then second floor, and through the aisles of the Walmart. I followed him further, but the child was not stopping. Eventually, when he stopped, he turned his face towards me. I got goosebumps and got shocked. I saw that that child was no ordinary child, and suddenly his complexion and appearance had changed. The whole half of that child's head was crushed in. The hands and feet were completely crooked, and there was not a single flesh on the whole body. He was bloodied. I closed my eyes very loudly and started chanting the name of God, and after a while, the child disappeared. When the CCTV footage was checked, the child was nowhere to be seen. I thought it was probably my nightmare. What should I tell everyone? No one would believe me. Then a few days later, I saw a lot of kids' spirits at that Walmart. There were about three or four children who were talking and walking towards me, trying to tell me something, but I couldn't understand. My situation got worse due to fear, and I didn't go back to work for a few days. Eventually, I went to see a priest. He gave me a locket. He said that if I wear this locket at all time, I won't see such things. A few days went fine. But after a few days, I went to the Walmart to collect my paycheck and was busy billing products. I saw a girl who was trying to say something, but the security guard was not letting her say anything. I went to check it out. She was acting a little weird. She said she's Sebastian's sister, Anita. I went up to her right away. Hey, Anita, I'm Anderson, Sebastian's friend. What's the matter? Listen, carefully, look. We have very little time. The death of my brother, Sebastian, was not an accident, but he was killed by my little brother's ghost. Whatever that was happening, it was happening after the death of his younger brother, Ray. Once, my mom had gone for some work on the ground floor. Perhaps her parcel had arrived, so she asked my brother, Sebastian, to take care of Ray. But Sebastian got busy with some work and could not attend to Ray. At that time, Ray was playing with his green-colored ball. While playing, his ball fell from the balcony. He went to the balcony, and he too fell from there. He was only eight years old when he died. Then Sebastian too was shocked and terrified. He always kept that ball with him at home. But one day, he took that ball here at the Walmart and mixed it with the toy section. The next day, Ray's ghost killed him which everyone called an accident. After his death, his soul came in that ball, and whoever went to that ball, I'm pretty sure that ball is in this Walmart. We just have to find that ball. Please let me go to the toy section. I will find it. Oh, God. Okay, I'll check with you. We didn't find that ball. Then I remembered that I had sold a ball two days ago. We did a lot of searching. Then in the camera recordings... We came to know that Mrs. Kendra has the ball now. We found her address and went there, but they weren't home. We told them everything on the phone. They too had become shocked after hearing that. In the Walmart shop one day later, Mrs. Kendra came there with her son Astern and the ball. Anita said, Where is your son? We have to save his life. Tell me! He disappeared. Eventually, we found him on the second floor. He was under someone else's control, 
and was going to hit himself in the head with a hammer. In the meantime, a worker of the Walmart came. He tried to snatch the hammer down from the child's hand. Then he pushed him back so hard backward that he fell down the stairs. Clearly the bone in his neck had broken. He died on sight. We all were completely terrified. Astern, don't do it! He gave us all a creepy little smile. Astern said, He will will go go with with me. me. Clearly not his voice. No, baby, why are you doing this? See, I'm your mama. Obey your mama, son. But he didn't listen at all, and hit his head so hard with a hammer that a lot of blood started coming out. The situation was not becoming under control at all. The more we refused him, the more the spirit used to torture that child. It was important for us, we had to save his life. After a while, Anita said, I know, Ray, it's you. You can't do that. You were a good kid. You always listened to your mom and to your sister. Sebastian is dead. He has got his punishment. Please leave everyone now. Go to your own world. Please, leave this innocent child. Okay, Okay. sister. Sister. After saying that, the kid calmed down a bit, and seeing the opportunity, Anita snatched the ball from his hand. The child was badly hurt, and it took him a long time to recover, but his life was saved by the grace of God, and we buried that ball near Reynard's grave. Nothing wrong ever happened to us, ever, after that incident. Sebastian was hiding something from me that day. I knew it. And it was nothing but that same ball in his hand. And maybe by mistake, he had left the ball in Walmart. And some other kid bought it. I'm writing this story because no one talks about it. No one talks about the incident that occurred seven years ago. The incident that ruined my life, that ruined me forever. I never knew that a simple mistake could cost you so much and could scar the very depths of your existence. No one blamed me for what happened, but I could never shake off the guilt. It was somewhat my fault, if only I had realized it sooner. I could have stopped it from happening. I still remember the painful cries of my mother. It happened six years ago, when I was 10 years old. I lived in a small town with my family. It was just me, my parents, and my little sister Helen, who was six years old. Since we lived in a small town, almost everyone knew each other somehow and were connected. Helen and I were enrolled in the same school. It was the best school in the area, and most of the kids were enrolled there. I would often see my little sister during break times or on the large ground. Our school wasn't top class or anything, but it was great in its way. The principal held all the necessary events. They would take us on short trips. We had sports festival students, etc. This was an exciting week for us since the students week was starting soon. Every day after classes ended, we would sit and discuss what our class would be doing for the students week. Every class has its discussion session before heading home. When I was done with my discussion, I grabbed my bag and headed out. I saw Helen near the school gates. She seemed to be talking to someone. I couldn't see where I was. So I started walking a bit faster. I was almost to the gate when I saw a tall man dressed as a clown. He was hidden well enough for you not to see him until you got really close. Um, Helen, what are you doing? I asked her in a lower voice than normal. Oh, big brother, look, I met Mr. Clown, and he says that he'll be my friend. She replied excitedly. I looked at my sister with a sad expression. She never got to make friends. Everyone in her class avoided her because she looked slightly different from normal kids. Just because there was a large birthmark across her face, the kids discriminated, and she was often the target of bullies. But she never let that bother her. She was kind and sweet and tried her best to fit in. I looked toward the clown to thank him for saying that to her and meant a lot. But as soon as I looked at his face, 
I couldn't say anything. His gaze shifted from me, then to Helen, and then to me, mentioning a creepy grin on his face. It wasn't the type of smile you wear when you're happy. He was smiling, but his eyes were dead and cold. I slowly shifted uncomfortably under his gaze. I grabbed Helen's hand. Come on, we're going home. Mom and dad are waiting. I said, keeping my eyes on the clown. She happily nodded and waved the clown by. I could feel his eyes on us as we walked away, but I dared not look back until we took a turn into the next street. I turned around to make sure he wasn't following us. For once, I was thankful our house was nearby. I couldn't wait to be behind the safe and secure walls of my house. I don't know, but that guy just gave me a bad feeling and my guts told me to stay away from him. I dropped my bag and I let it plop on the floor. Like always, my mom greeted us and asked us about school. As expected, Helen mentioned her clown friend. Mom looked at me with a questioning gaze, and I told her the story and about what I thought about the clown. My parents only chuckled. They both knew very well that I was scared of clowns. That night, I woke up just as usual. I went to the bathroom in the kitchen to drink some water. And just like every other day, I checked up on my little sister before heading back to my room. Our rooms were on the second floor. I opened her door, walked in. I looked around and just when I was leaving, something caught my attention. I looked out of her bedroom window and saw the same clown standing in the middle of the road, illuminated by the streetlight. I stumbled back in shock and fell to the ground. I was breathing heavily and I slowly got up to look out of the window, but the clown was now gone. I didn't mention this incident to my parents or anyone else since I wasn't sure if I didn't imagine things. A few days passed and I didn't see that clown, that I was thankful for. It was finally students week. The school was filled with different stalls, some for food, some for games, and some for other entertainment. Our class had a game stall and we offered different prizes to the winner. As the day went by, we closed our stall and went to see the other stalls. I realized the school was packed with people and it was hard to move around. My friends and I were heading to a food stall that was said to be great. As I was slowly moving between the crowd, I saw Helen from the corner of my eyes. I raised my hand to call her, but before I could call out her name, I saw that red curly hair. My face turned white. It was the same clown from a few days ago. He was talking to Helen and was leading her somewhere. My guts told me to stop her right away. I desperately started pushing through the crowd. I needed to stop her. I moved through the crowd. One of my friends asked me if everything was okay and I explained to him the situation. At first he thought I was kidding, but then he realized I wasn't. We were searching and I saw my little sister near the front gate. She was innocently smiling at the clown and my heart broke. In a few moments, I was running toward the gate as fast as I could. I looked around, but they were nowhere to be seen. I immediately started to run back home. I had to tell them about what had happened. They called the police and reported the incident. The police told us to wait as they sent out a search team. Later that day, the phone began to ring. It was my mom's friend, Carol. She told her that she saw Helen with some clown. She tried calling out to Helen, but they were gone before she could. They seemed to be headed to the forest. My mother dropped to the ground and my father quickly called the police. Later, they called us and told us that they had found my little sister's body. The body was in such a bad shape that they could barely recognize her. I won't go into further detail because it is too hard for me to bring back the memory of her broken little body. To think that innocent smiling face would be the last I would see of my sister. Hi, this is Leonardo. I'm 35 now. I'll tell you a 
terrible story that happened to my wife Patricia seven years back. All this happened to her when I wasn't even in her life. When I came into her life, she told me all these things. I was also very surprised after knowing her real horror story. So the story starts. Patricia was a tall, talented, attractive and beautiful girl. She'd also been part of a beauty pageant at the time. There would hardly be any man in her area who doesn't love or like her. She lived with her dear mother. They both were delighted, but soon everything was about to change. So, one day, she went for a morning walk. Mom, I'm going, okay? <laughs> okay, honey. Honey, take your glasses too. You've just had an eye operation. Take care. And she left home. She enjoys walking in the park, but after a while, she realized that someone is following her for a long time. Who, who's there? Who's there? No one responded. She didn't see anything, but heard only the sound of someone's footsteps. She got scared a little. She thought that maybe that would be her illusion, so she didn't pay much attention to it. So, after that day, when she'd left for the market, she felt that someone was following her throughout the way. She looked back and saw no one there. She was very scared after that incident. And when she came back from the market, she still felt that someone was following her. She was very upset, but she didn't tell her mum anything because she didn't want her mother to be more upset because of her. And time passed like that. A few days later, an important meeting was about to take place in her office, and at the same time, the tire of her car was punctured, and she was suspecting that the disgusting work must be done by the same man or stalker. And even without wanting to travel, she had to travel by bus on the day for her meeting. While traveling by bus, she saw the real face of the stalker. He was also there. She got utterly scared witnessing the man's face because he didn't look like an ordinary man. His age was about 30 years, maybe. His teeth were yellow and his eyes were completely red. He was wearing torn old clothes that had lots and lots of holes in them. On looking closely, she realized that his clothes were also covered with bloodstains. Seeing that, her condition deteriorated completely. But the man was constantly staring at her, not even blinking at all. It seemed that he was doing that for some purpose. Oh, oh my God, who's he? he? Is he going to kill me? The stalker slowly started moving toward her. Fortunately, the bus stopped at the station at the correct time, and she quickly got off the bus, took a sigh of relief. When she looked back to see him, she saw that he was still looking at her, which was creepy and abnormal. He was also smiling, and, uh, and he was saying, Bye, bye, Georgia. Come back soon to me, me. <laughs> the man's mental condition wasn't looking right, so she ignored him again. She couldn't understand whose name he was talking about. She had a cousin named Alex. He'd come to stay in her house for a few days. Patricia had told him everything. He said he would help her if something happened again. So, th the next day, she got her car fixed, and the same day was her office holiday. She was sitting by a window and doing her work. She saw a little boy approaching her car and blowing the air out of her car. Then Alex reached to him and talked to him, smilingly. She was sure. She was sure that it was all done by Alex. But why? It may be a trap for Patricia. Things got even worse when she saw the stalker in front of her house. Mom! Mom, come here! He's... he's there! Hoo-hoo! I, I can't see anyone! Then Alex came over there. The man ran away. Patricia told her mom everything. Now, now, now I think he will kill me. We, we have to call the police right now. You should have told me all this earlier. Why, why didn't you tell me? H hurry, call the police. Alex? Police inquired about him but couldn't find him for many days. There was no proof against him. She'd taken several days off from the office and didn't go out also, but, but one day her mom felt very keen to eat ice cream and she reached the market with Alex and her mum to get some ice cream. They knew that the stalker could come from anywhere. That's why they were also alert, and they planned that they would return home soon. So, when Patricia entered an ice cream shop to get ice cream, all of a sudden the stalker came after her. Alex punched him hard, but the stalker became successful in running away from there. 
He followed him and caught the stalker on the road. He held the stalker's throat tightly and punched him in the face, then kicked him in the stomach. I will not leave you today. You annoy her a lot. Tell me, who sent you? Tell me. He started crying. <laughs> Don't know why. George, <laughs> it's me. <laughs> oh, please. Stay away, you, you idiot. Why are you doing this to me, huh? We, we, we should hand him over to the police. On hearing the police name, the stalker got scared terribly. He was acting weird. Finally, he was caught by the police. When he got caught by the police, the whole truth came out. Why are you doing this? Why are you following Patricia for so many days? Hmm? What do you want? <laughs> I had a sister named Georgia. Uh, I loved her a lot. One day, when both of us were going on vacation in our car, where we, where we had a vast accident, I, 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 I lost her. <laughs> Patricia had an eye operation one year ago, and her eyes are my sister's eyes. Mm -hmm. Patricia had a cornea transplant at the time. I, I can't bring her back in my life, but, but, but I go to see Patricia again and again as, as my sister. Sister. <laughs> Later, the police told the whole truth to Patricia. Knowing the truth, Patricia and her mother were quite surprised. After all, the eye she had was his sister's eye. For so long it seemed to Patricia that the man wanted to kill her, but that was nothing like it. It hurt her how wrong she was thinking about him. We have tried to find out his complete background. It's been found that he is a victim of depression. His mother had died in his childhood and there was only one reason for happiness in his life, and that was his sister, and she too had gone away from him. And when he came to know that his sister's eye was transplanted in yours, that's why he wanted to meet you. Patricia was sad about it. My husband, Brendan, contracted a weird disease with a long name I can't remember. It was terrible. His body was rotting from the inside out. Every day was excruciatingly painful, and even though it was curable, the medicine was way more expensive than I could afford. We were living in a small apartment in the cheaper estates. We were living an okay life, like any other couple in our apartment complex. I work nights and do overtime to make up for our bills and the medicines required. It hurts me to watch him physically die. I'm trying so hard and taking every shift I can get to help. One day, I was returning from my night duty as a bartender in uptown New York. It's quite far away from our apartment complex, but the job pays well, and I can drink some free cocktails, so what the heck, why not? I also got my husband's meds refilled from the CVS nearby, and got myself some pizza and OJ. I mean, this was the only thing that was grounding me in reality, but for some reason, things didn't feel right. I reached the elevator. Something wasn't right. Nothing was right. The air was colder than I liked, and the tension was so thick I could be sliced with a knife. I never liked the elevator, but today it was super creepy. Suddenly, I saw all the buttons are pressed, and I felt the presence of someone. I froze, but then I turned back to check, and I was horrified. I drank some of the orange juice to cut back on the alcohol from the tequila I had after my shift. I can hold my alcohol, but now I felt it. I wanted to throw up, and I pressed on the button four multiple times to try and get to our floor a bit faster, but it was unsuccessful. After that, I blacked out. I heard people banging the door and felt light in my eyes. I was escorted out near my door. My neighbors, the four young men who lived across from us, took me near my door and then tried to wake me up to consciousness. When I woke up, I reacted violently, but I was given some water and calmed down. They asked me about my condition, but when I told them, three of them laughed, while another, the fourth man with tattoos, just smiled knowingly. He knew something that I, or for that matter, even his roommates did not know. When I came back home, I brushed my teeth and chatted with my husband, and he complained about monsters in the closet. Now, this is weird, 
I know nothing is normal now, but aren't 26 year olds a little too old for closet monsters? I tried to talk him out of it, but he was adamant. I wanted to talk science and logic to him, but I could not dismiss him completely after that incident. After a nice little nap and a wrap up with my chores, I had to go to work, and I did not like the idea of using the elevator, but I cannot use the stairs. I am afraid of them. They make me feel restless. But the elevator was equally troublesome. Anyways, I just took the elevator, and then it was worse. This time, I saw a man having a scary aura with a smell reeking of alcohol and rotten meat. I tried to take off, but this man held me by my wrist and pushed me into the elevator. He tried to choke me while pressing number four on the elevator, and I could not move away from him. He was stronger. He whispered in my ear, There were crimes done before, and there will be done till the day your so-called home is not free from me. I live here so no one else can. I felt I was dying, but the only thing I could think of was the safety of Brendan. Finally, after some struggling, he left me, and I ran towards my apartment. I turned around and saw a script. It said, My den shall never be yours, and most importantly, he will die, and then you will. I couldn't take this lightly anymore. Supernatural might be real. I decided to do some research. I went to a cafe and used a laptop to get some history behind our apartment. Why did we get that apartment for so cheap? Why was it called our den? Turns out that the apartment had a cruel history. The reason why we could find this apartment at such a low place was that this was a place where multiple people committed suicide. All of them experienced the same thing. A man overlooking them when they were sleeping. And if anyone stayed up all night to keep a watch, would either die by weird diseases or would kill themselves. I wish I would have done my research seriously, but now I have no time. I called the police, but they were dismissive. After a lot of convincing, I managed to let them search my house. This is where things got weird. A crime scene cleaner was called, and he peeled something that looked like wallpaper from the ceiling. After some investigation, I hear them say, Yep, human. I was like, What? What's human? They said these are human skins. That is exactly what it is not wallpapers. That apartment was that of some local celebrity woman who killed her husband because she had an affair with another man. She mixed sleeping pills in his food, and when he slept, she called her boyfriend and cut his body into many pieces. He was alive when she did it. She hid his bones and body parts there. She started to enjoy every night there. One day, she was bathing, and the ghost of her husband appeared, and he killed her in the bathtub. Since then, his ghost started to bother everyone who stays in that apartment. The apartment was cleaned up, and the young men who were my neighbors were called for evidence. This is where things got weirder. There was only three. When I asked them about the fourth one, they denied his existence. I described him, and they denied his existence. So, then I hired a sketcher and gave him a description. When I took the sketch to the cops, it got weird. Turns out this sketch looked like the husband of the celebrity. Now I kind of did the two and two together, and then realized something. He wanted to avenge his death. We moved away from that place, and Brendan's health started to improve. This incident happened three years ago, and now Brendan is fine. However, he does not remember a lot of those painful days. He loves horror movies, games, and stories, and laughs them off as bullshit. But I cannot. Who knows? There is another one lurking for us, and I can feel a pair of eyes. Hello viewers, this is Carol Jonathan. I'm 31 years old now. I am going to tell you a true horror incident that happened to me seven years ago. I worked in a big company in my city. I got a job and I loved it. I used to do my work with full dedication. I had also made a friend in the office. She was very nice and hardworking, named Leslie. My coworker Norman came to me. He had proposed to me, but I refused him because I had no such feelings in my heart for him. He was a nice person, and I was his friend only, and nothing more than that. My boss, named Terence, was very happy with my work. He proposed to me for marriage one day, and my happiness knew no bounds. He was four years older than me at that time. Yes, I will. I love you too and we hugged each other tightly. Everyone in the office congregated, and now we have a few months left for our wedding. Our office was very big, 
and its construction was finished two and a half years back. There were many elevators, but I used to come and go by elevator number two because it was the elevator near my office desk. One day when I was going home from the office, it was eight o'clock in the evening. I was very late due to work. My fiance, my boss, was waiting for me outside the office. He used to drop me off often at home. So a girl came from behind. I did not know her. I thought she was probably a worker. I smiled looking at her. She also smiled looking at me. As soon as I entered the elevator, she pushed me hard, and I fell very hard inside the elevator. My hand was badly injured and I had to get it plastered. On checking in the whole office, nothing was known about that girl, but I did notice a locket around her neck. I was suspicious of Mr. Terrence, so I asked him about his ex-girlfriend. He told me that he had girlfriends named Monica and Enna. She wanted to marry him only for money. That's why he left them both. Now he has nothing to do with them. Norman told me that I should stay away from Terrence, but I thought he was only jealous. I was very scared. After that, some strange things started happening to me. I had a nightmare every night. I saw a man with a scar on his chest brutally strangling and torturing a woman. Sometimes I would see two or three girls being murdered brutally. That was a very unsettling moment and creepy too. Once I went into Mr. Terrence's cabin without informing him. My friend Leslie was there too. I got a little angry seeing them together. Oh, honey, what happened? See this file? And Leslie left from there. She looked a bit upset that day. I asked her, but she didn't tell me anything. I pressed the elevator button, and the elevator door opened. Somebody's body was lying inside, and it was Leslie's body. I screamed in fear. Someone shoved down her throat brutally and stabbed her in the back. It was really unsettling. There was blood in the elevator. Everyone reached there and called the ambulance and police. Everyone was shocked. After a few days when I was inside the elevator, the elevator suddenly stopped. I got very scared. I called, but there was no network on the phone. I started to panic. Who's in the elevator? Suddenly, Leslie's ghost appeared in front of me, which was very scary to see. I was numb. Her eyes were very big, red, and her body was thin. I was blown away by fear and I fainted there. Terence took me to a priest, but we got no solution. My life had become a hell. I used to have nightmares every night, and that was the night when I was about to find out who that girl was. I could not see the faces of those girls clearly in my dream, and that night I could see those faces clearly for the first time. One of the girl's faces was exactly matching that of the girl who once pushed me hard in the elevator, and the locket around her neck had M written on it. Once, when it was a holiday in the office, I secretly went into the office. When I thoroughly investigated the cabin of the Terrence, I came to know about his truth there. The records of those girls, whom I had seen in my nightmare, were there, Monica and Enna. And all of them had been murdered, maybe. Then I just had to confirm that Terrence has a mark or scar on his chest. I had called him. He came. I seduced him and opened the buttons of his shirt and saw that same scar was on his chest. He was the main culprit. <laughs> what do you think? You'll investigate me and I will not even know anything? Yes, I killed both of them. Now, it's your turn. But why did you do this? What did you get from doing this? I have money, power. I can do whatever I want. I can buy whomever I want. I want to sleep with every girl. And after that, I love torturing and killing girls, especially those who are beautiful and smart like you, dear. Please leave me. I won't tell anybody anything. Your friend Leslie was having an affair with me, and I killed her because she was repeatedly threatening me that she would go and tell everyone the whole truth. And Anna was pretty and shy. I tortured her to death, cut her throat, and I kept her in my secret room. 
Next is you, baby. I killed Monica too. I loved her so much. At that time, the construction work in the office was going on. I was talking to my partner at the time, and that partner was none other than Norman. He knew absolutely everything about my truth. I gave him a lot of money just to shut his mouth, so she heard everything and started blackmailing me. I tried to kill her, but she escaped and went inside the elevator, which was not working. She started panicking and hitting the walls of the elevator, and suddenly, the elevator fell down hard and she died at the spot. And in this way, I escaped from the police and her death proved to be an accident. When he was telling me all those things, I saw the opportunity and picked up the pot kept there and hit him on his head. I quickly ran from there. I pressed the elevator button and I went inside the elevator. I quickly came to the floor below. I forgot to call the police and he had snatched my phone. And I again saw the spirit of Monica and Enna over there. I begged them to help me. So as soon as Terrence went inside the elevator, it stopped in the middle. He was yelling. Help! help. I came out. Suddenly the spark flared up and the whole elevator started burning in the fire. And I could hear his screams very loudly. I tried to save him, but he could not survive. I ran away from there and called the police with the help of a stranger outside the office. Hey, this is Joe. I'm a computer engineer. I'm 35 years old. Today I'm going to tell you a terrible true horror story which took place seven years ago. There was a close friend of mine. His name was Harris. He was my colleague also. Both of us had jobs in a very big company in the city. He married his beautiful girlfriend named Eva. She was charming, tall, and intelligent. I'm also married, and I have two kids now. Seven years ago, while in the office, he seemed worried for a couple days. Whenever I asked him anything, he used to avoid it. I got angry with him when he told me something. He said, Harris, man, nowadays, my wife gets really angry with me, even for small things. Whenever I try to explain something to her, she doesn't understand me at all. The relationship is not going well. What should I do, man? Hey, look, dude. No solution will come out of fighting and arguing. Whatever's the matter, take time and solve it with a calm mind. Please don't make any brash decisions and definitely don't do it in anger. You'll be sorry later. Be calm and explain things as best you can. If possible, I'll talk to my sister-in-law. I tried my best to end the situation between them, but the quarrel was getting worse. I used to talk to Ava on the phone sometimes. I used to try to solve the problems going on. Those days, all we engineers had a huge workload, so we were doing night shifts in the office. But Harris wasn't interested in night shifts. One day, Harris came into the office. Hey dude, I think I'm going to try the night shift today. I don't even want to stay home now, even at night. Life is stressful. I think it's better for me to just stay busy with work. I agreed with him I would do the night shift also that night because he was a good friend of mine. One day, Eva called. I received it. She said, Harris has become very suspicious and possessive. He keeps a close watch on me and is not allowing me to do any of my jobs. I'm completely fed up with him. I think I'm gonna divorce him soon. I was so sad for them. For a few days, he was doing extraordinary things, such as drinking water from the water bottle. I didn't even know where he kept that bottle. He even started forgetting a few things. He repeatedly said his wife had cheated on him. She was secretly starting to talk to someone on the phone, and sometimes even going to meet him. After a few days in the office on the night shift, I don't know what happened to Harris that day. He was repeatedly pointing towards the window. Dude, there's a girl wearing a black dress standing there, staring at me for a long time. Do you see her? Harris, what are you talking about? No one's there. Look at her, bro, right there. That girl's no ordinary girl. There's red little spots on her face. I think I can see bones visible. She's a long, creepy looking black tongue. Dude, there's nothing, man. It's the night shift, bro. You're starting to see things. Just calm down. That same night when I was thirsty at 3.30, I went to fill my water bottle and also went to the bathroom to just clear up a bit. 
I washed my face, and while washing my face, I saw someone's shadow in the mirror. I was terrified to see that. As I looked back, no one was there, but I felt like a woman was standing there. There was a colleague named George in our office. He was nice and a hard-working person. He also came on time, but one day, he was nowhere to be seen. There's a small storage room on the floor below our office. I saw Harris coming out of that room. When I asked about it, he didn't say anything. So the next night, when I asked Harris about Eva, Harris said, she'd gone to her maternal home for a few days. Harris was repeatedly going to that garage room. I also secretly thought of going there to find out what was going on. And when I went there, I was shocked and numb after seeing the scene. I saw it was my colleague, George. Someone had pierced his stomach with a sharp piece of wood that went through and through. There was blood all over the wall. I understood that Harris probably did something wrong. Just as I was about to call the police, he came over there and snatched my phone and broke it. Joe, what are you doing? You okay? Uh, yeah, um, I was just calling my wife, brother. Oh, you saw his dead body? He's gone. I know you were about to call the police, and you two are unfaithful, like my wife. Oh, my luck. My wife is not in the house for two days now. She must have ran away with her lover. Please, man, you know me. Just leave me, Harris. I'm your best friend, man. I won't tell anybody. You know why I killed George? Because he was having the affair with my wife. Hmm. I think you must have had an affair with my wife, too. That's why you support her. Isn't it? Just then, he pulled out a knife and started to attack me. I grabbed his wrist and tried to wrestle the knife out of his hands. There was lots of fighting. Eventually, I pushed him back and started to run away. I ran and went to the security guard. Hey, what happened? Call the police, please. Then suddenly, Harris came and stabbed the security guard's chest with a knife. He died on the spot. I quickly started running towards the road. He was following me. Suddenly, I heard a sound from behind me. That sound was Harris shouting or screaming in pain. Ah! I'll kill you! He was talking to himself. It was as if he was fighting with himself. Suddenly, he stabbed himself in the chest with the knife which he had. That scene is still in my mind. It was unsettling. I was completely numb. Why would he do that? Who would do that? I was going to get the answer later. I was so scared that I fainted after that. When I regained consciousness, I came to realize that Harris had died. Hearing the truth, I was completely blown away. The policeman said, When we searched Harris's whole house, we found his wife's body there. Her body was two days gone. He had killed her. He had amnesia. He didn't remember that his wife had died earlier. I also told the whole thing to the police, which happened during the night shift. Officer, why did he kill his wife? Well, according to the post-mortem report, his wife's death was an accident. They also checked the video recordings of Harris's house. We found that both of them fought about something. Then Harris got really angry and pushed his wife in anger near the basement. Because the basement door was open that day, she fell down the stairs. And then he left. Due to his amnesia, he couldn't remember that he killed his wife. But I didn't believe Harris could ever do something like that. He never told me about his illness and why he stabbed himself that night. I still don't understand it. And I think it must be the soul of his wife who was doing so. Sometimes, I wish I would never have done the night shift and that horrible incident wouldn't happen to me. But I'm a firm believer that whatever happens, happens for a reason. Hello, my name's Ron. I may seem like just another lonely and bitter old man in a wheelchair, but back in my youth, things were different. It wasn't until that terrible night that I began my downward spiral, turning me into what you see now. Looking back, I can see my life was perfect when I was 27. I had that never-ending energy reserved only for the young. I was bursting with potential. I didn't have any responsibilities to tie me down. And most importantly, I had a job that I enjoyed with the National Park Service. It kept me outdoors, active, and helping others. I was fulfilled. 
I was happy. I worked as a park ranger in Zion National Park. The job was fantastic and everything I could have wanted. I spent my days outdoors in the park, helping visitors, guiding groups, and ensuring the rules and regulations were being followed. Even after years on the job, I never grew tired of Utah sunsets over the mountain ranges. I worked in paradise. Everything began to change one evening when my supervisor caught up to me as I was going home for the day. I had put on my jacket, grabbed my keys, and was exiting the Hello. door out of the office. My name's Ro when Roland, Hello. my supervisor, my called name's Ron. Me. I may seem like hey, just another lonely and bitter old man Hold in a on. wheelchair. Roland but back shouted in my youth, slightly out of breath things as he were different towards me. It was God until you haven't that terrible yet. night that I he began my downward me. spiral, His demeanor changed turning me into what you see now. Deep worry. Roland described that unusual and eerie problems were striking his night shift rangers. Rangers sighted seeing silhouettes of men in trees and bushes, only to vanish upon further inspection. Park carts were being vandalized and damaged. Mysterious messages were left on popular park sites, written in bright red paint. The messages usually contained threats and obscenities, planting fear in the heart of the night shift rangers. The latest and worst occurred the night before, when a rookie ranger was attacked by a group of men and left blood all over the trail. When the park police arrived, the injured ranger claimed that some of his attackers vanished into thick canopy of trees, while others fled underground. The ranger had experienced head trauma that affected his senses, Roland said. There was no way someone could vanish underground. I listened awestruck. I had no idea any of this was happening, I said. I haven't encountered anything all of this time. Right, Roland said thoughtfully. These are occurring only at night, and they're getting more violent. Listen, Ron, he began. Listen to me here for a second. I knew where this was headed. I now have a ranger in the hospital, and have a whole night division in fear of coming to work. Three have already called in sick. He gestured air quotations with his fingers, sarcastically rolling his eyes. And no one to cover the night chef. Oh, I don't know, Roland. I began anticipating the question. Come on, Ron. I'm asking for a favor here. I need a veteran ranger to show these newbies how to handle these situations. It'll only be a week or two tops. Please. I reluctantly agreed, doing it only as a favor to Ron, who had helped my career for years. He beamed. See you tomorrow night, he said halfway out the door. I'll bring the coffee, he winked. All right, all right, I'm there, I said unenthusiastically Hello. as I entered the office. my name's Ron. Shit, Roland said, startled. He held the radio in his hand. Shit, Ron, you're right on time. We need help. Victor just radioed in a cry for help. He was extremely distressed, and to top it off, he's not responding anymore. Roland's voice was full of panic. His cart's GPS is signaling it's near a royal creek. Do you think you can go check out what happened? I agreed. Surely it wasn't anything serious. I drove off into the night, a cup of coffee in my hand, as I arrived at a royal creek. Nothing seemed particularly concerning. A park cart stood by the creek's edge, tires sinking slightly into the wet soil, the motor still running. The moon glistened brightly on the water that swayed fluidly, filling the night silence with the indistinguishable sound of running water. The water turned the usual bright red soil into a crimson tone that resembled blood. I moved along the creek, calling for Victor. Out of the corner of my eye, something glistened above the bank. Footprints. It was odd. It looked like multiple pairs ran in unison towards a stack of large boulders. I approached cautiously, beginning to feel the tingle of fear within. The track stopped abruptly in front of the boulders. I stared confused at how someone's journey could just end there. I heard it before I felt it. A loud thud filled my ears, and I realized something had struck my head. When the blood began to drip down my face, darkness clouded my vision, and I tumbled to the ground, losing consciousness. I saw flashes of men dragging my body towards the rocks. One removed some of the smaller boulders to reveal a small hatch. The last thing I noticed was the hatch opening, entering, and being dragged through an underground labyrinth. Darkness took over. My eyes opened, corneas burning at the bright light before me. 
my body stood before a small fire, illuminating an underground room. Two men stood watching me. They were a dark tan color and had long braided hair that ran beyond their shoulder. Another man laying in the corner of the room, soaked in his blood. Victor. He was shaking violently and mumbled nonsensical sounds pleading. This land belongs to us, began one of the two men in a deep and heavy voice. It belonged to our ancestors before your kind took it from us. Our tribe worked on this land for hundreds of years. Our blood and tears made this land plentiful. Until you arrived. In the room corner, Victor's body convulsed in a puddle of his blood. Our warnings have been ignored, and now we will take more drastic measures. The two nodded at each other. The second man withdrew a small pistol from his pocket and shot Victor. Victor's body fell limp. Maybe this kind of message, you'll understand. The gun was raised, and I heard it again before I felt it. A small stream of blood flowed from my waist like a small watering hole. Quickly, my body began to shiver, and I felt something for the first time that would soon become unfamiliar. I lost sensitivity below my waist. Again, darkness began to befall me, but before I succumbed to the darkness, I heard the men scream, and more gunshots erupt from multiple directions. I woke up in a hospital bed, unable to move for days later. The doctors explained that the bullet had caused permanent damage to my spine as it passed through me. I listened, unable to internalize what was being said. Days later, a familiar visitor arrived in my room. Roland explained what occurred that night. As soon as I stopped responding to my radio, law enforcement had been dispatched to the GPS location of my park cart. A path of footprints and the residue left by my body being dragged led them to the underground room just in time. But I questioned whether they had arrived on time or too late as I tried to move my legs. I am thankful for my life, but I regret accepting that night shift. While I could walk away with my life, I lost a big part of me that day. That was the start of the journey that led me to the man I am today. Bitter, disabled, but at least I'm alive. Hi, my name is James Smith. I'm 30 now. Today I'm going to tell you a horrible story which will blow your mind. This incident happened when I was 25 years old. I had a close friend named Tim. He was also 25. We were like brothers. We both used to work as security guards in the same apartment. Well, it was a fresh morning. Both of us were just chatting away. Tim asked, Hey brother, you had breakfast yet? I said, No bro, not yet. I think I might stop by the shop for some treats. We'll see. Then we both heard the sound of a car which sounded really expensive. We both turned back shocked. A girl came out of that car. She was very beautiful and her clothes, whew, sexy. She was wearing a red dress. Her hair was so pretty and shiny that I just got lost in her beauty on seeing her. Tim just kept looking at her. Not a single word came out of his mouth. He was surprised to see such beauty around here. She was like an actress. It was as if she just finished shooting and had come to live in the apartment. Her name was Christina Jonas. Christina said, Hello, can I have the key to number 411? Oh, okay ma'am. We'll take your luggage. We'll deliver it to your apartment. We delivered her luggage and went. It was as if Tim had become crazy about her. He was talking to me again and again about her. Tim had a nice nature. After all, we were best friends. Everyone in the colony considered him very decent because he was always ahead in helping everyone. Whether they were young or old, he would help anyone. That's why he was a popular security guard in the apartment. He even was a little shy. One day, Christina was coming home from shopping. While shopping, one of her boxes fell down. Tim said that he'll take that box to her house. Suddenly, a boy named Alexander came there. Alexander said, Give me that box. I'll give it to her. She's my friend. Hey, sir, you don't need to worry. 
I'll give this box to her. Alexander, now kind of more angry. I said I'll give it to her. You stay here. Alexander lived in the floor above Christina. He used to like her a lot, so he used to go there and try to hang around with her. He eventually went there for frequent visits. They'd become close friends. And just like that, a couple of months passed, and that friendship grew even deeper. One day, Christina was looking really upset. It was as if she was worried about something. The next day, Christina's maid Rihanna reached their house and knocked on the door, but no one responded for a long time when she knocked. Open the door, please, ma'am. But the door opened after a little push from her. It meant that the door was already open. When Rihanna went inside, she was completely surprised. There was blood on the floor, everywhere. She got terrified. Then she moved forward, a dead body lying just inside which belonged to Christina. Someone had mercilessly chopped her to pieces, and it seemed as if something wrong had happened. There were no clothes on the body. Rihanna screamed, and some people came. We heard the noise, and both Tim and I ran towards the flat. How can someone be so cruel? The whole room was filled with blood. The scene there was so dangerous that even the maid had become dizzy. Christina's fingers were chopped off. The killer tried to cut her left hand, but it wasn't completely gone. He almost cut off each of her legs. I got goosebumps seeing such a scene. It was terrible. Everyone was shocked. Tim called the police immediately. Police came to the place and an investigation started right away. During the investigation, it was found that Alexander used to visit her house continuously, which we knew. There was a wristwatch on the floor. It was a gentleman's watch. This watch belongs to Alexander. Yeah, he used to visit her house, and the day before the murder took place, she was upset. Tim said, Christina was really nice, used to help everyone. Don't know who would have done this to him, sir. Let's catch him. And it was also known from the CCTV footage that he had come there at night. Police went to his flat, but it was locked. So, police started searching for Alexander. We all got to know that he murdered Christina, and that's why he escaped. After three days, police found him. He was caught at a friend's house. Here at the police station, the detective said, Hello, Mr. Alexander. Now there's no use in you hiding whatever you know. Tell us clearly. All the evidence points towards you. I'm not trying to hide anything. Whatever I'm saying, I promise is the truth. I haven't done any such thing to Christina. I went to her house that day because I had an argument with her, and I just want to apologize. The police did a third degree on him. Nothing was found. He got bailed after 15 days. Now, after almost a month went by, there lived one child who lived in the apartment next to Christina. He repeatedly tried to tell me something, but I didn't know why he was so scared. I tried to ask him a lot, and I asked again and again, and finally he opened his mouth. The child said, Christina, she fought Uncle Tim. She was shouting at him very much, and when Uncle came out, he had tears in his eyes. He was crying and seemed angry too. I had a half early exam the next day. That's why I was awake. It was 12 o'clock at night. When I told my parents, they forbade me to tell all these things to the police. I went to the parents of that child and talked about it. They told me that was absolutely true because she did not want to get involved in the murder case. That's why they didn't tell the police or anyone about it. So as soon as I came to know all that, I immediately went to the police and told the matter. Because he was my childhood friend and he was very gentle, I never thought he would do such a brutal thing in his life. I had to go to the police. After this incident, his different face came in front of everyone. People couldn't believe that he could do something like this. So police caught him and investigated. Third degree was done on him. Many charges were filed against Tim, but he was not ready to say anything. On the eighth day, he spoke. You bloodthirsty man, now open your mouth. Talk. Yes, yes, yes. I did. I did it. I killed her. She didn't listen to me at all. I loved her so much. A day before her murder, I'd express my love to her, but she rejected me. Oh, Jesus. She said that she was in love with Alexander and that she wants to marry him. Hearing this made my mind go completely out of control. I tried to explain to her a lot, but she wasn't ready to even listen. I just got so angry. I slit her throat and killed her right there. Tim, you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail. But I loved her so much. I wanted to celebrate a honeymoon with her and get married. 
I was going to cut her into pieces and then transport her body away from the scene. But Alexander got there before me and I had to flee. He rang the door and I guess he thought Christina was too angry after their fight earlier that day. He said he'll come again in the morning to apologize and just left. I can't believe I never saw this, but my best friend Tim was a psycho. He was in prison for life. I couldn't believe that Tim, my best friend, was a murderer. I can remember using Tinder for the first time, not getting many matches and then putting the phone down. Around 23.45 at night, my phone then starts going off and stupidly I answered it with me being half asleep saying, Hello? Who's this? The reply was a very angry drunk man saying, Listen mate, you have got to stop texting my girlfriend on Tinder. My initial thoughts were I would have a match and I didn't. And I then proceeded to wind him up saying, Why the hell is your girlfriend on Tinder? Clearly you're not giving her what she wants. He then replied saying that he's going to kill me. Then I put the phone down and laughed it off as I'm used to this, as I'm an attractive bloke. However, I did find it strange that I never put my number out, or my details for that matter, but it was so late that I didn't give it much thought. The next day, I was working a late shift at my old health club. As I finished my shift, I went to my car. Then I get a text saying, behind you. I just ignored the text. But then the next photo made me jump. It was a photo of me outside the building I worked. Now I was scared, my heart dropped, and I could feel my legs sweating. I looked around, but nothing, so I kept walking to my car. Then I heard footsteps like someone was running, so I turned around. There I saw a guy with what I can only describe as a metal pole. Now I'm around 6 foot 2 and he's proper 5'10". He then hit me with the metal pole and dropped it. He tackled me to the ground, then he proceeded to punch, grab, and strangle me. But when I found an opening as I was trying to get this guy off, I wrapped my legs around him and took his body weight right off me. Then I punched him so hard that I knocked him out, cold. I called the police and they came and arrested him. Who knows what could have happened if I didn't answer that text. My real question is, how did he get my number? And how did he know where I worked? I still use Tinder today, but I'm so careful when I pick up the phone now. If I see a number I don't recognize, I tend to block it. Working at Hooters isn't for the faint of heart. It's guaranteed that when you're a woman, filling out an application, you're giving men permission to only look at your breasts and nothing else. I'm not even sure our customers know what our faces look like. It is a literal requirement to own an impressive rack to get the job. I was surprised when Glenn, the manager, called me in for an interview after seeing what I lacked. I sat down across from him and he started asking me the basic questions. Why do you want to work at Hooters? What's your availability? Tell me about yourself. Where do you see yourself in five years? I felt my answers were good until it was time to ask about the uniform. Okay, Ginger, I have to be blunt with you. You don't have very big breasts. That's the attraction of our clientele. It's a requirement here. I swallowed and nodded. No, I don't. I know that's the requirement here, but... He cut me off. If you know, what drove you here? I've always wanted to feel more confident in myself and be a waitress. I feel this job could do that for me. Glenn smiled at me and leaned over his desk to meet my eyes. Lucky for you, Ginger. You don't have to worry about the size of your... goods. See, the women who work for me are required to take enhancers. They work as quickly as overnight. The other girls here have seen amazing benefits, and you will too. I agreed to take the pills when I accepted the job. I was extremely nervous about it, but I took some that night, and when I woke up the next day, I was amazed to see that I had gone from an A cup to a B cup. With a boost of confidence, I got out of bed and tackled the day before I started my first shift at Hooters. I put on my uniform, which I wasn't sure would fit until I woke up to a whole new cup size. I still had a ways to go, but the way these worked, I'd be a D in a matter of a few days, and then I would really fill out the shirt. A couple of girls walked up to me with friendly smiles on their faces. Hi, I'm Brittany. I'll be training you tonight. I'm Fallon the host. You come to me if anyone here gives you trouble. 
it's nice to meet you. I smiled as we all shook hands. Brittany's energy seemed intense, but she was cool and I was looking forward to working with her. That night turned out to be difficult as the guys weren't interested in me serving them. Brittany told me not to worry about it. She told me the story of when she started, how she was too lacking in the plush, perky breast department. Within days, it all changed as she took the enhancers and she loved it here. She even took it well when clients dehumanized her. Her attitude had her thanking them for it. It was as though her breasts were the most important things that kept her validated and a valued employee at Hooters. Fallon carried the same attitude. It was as though they were slaves to the clientele and if they were happy, Glenn was happy and work went smoothly. It all seemed too good to be true, but as I took the enhancers, I built my way up to a double D. I saw what it meant. I it all started two weeks ago. As usual, my friend Mike and Sally went to Hooters to have some food and drinks. That day was different than others, because instead of going there to have fun, we went there to make Mike feel better about the recent divorce process he was going through. None of us would know this innocent night would turn into a nightmare that I still have to deal with daily. When we first sat there, Mike would cheerily talk with us. If we were not his close friends, we would not understand the sadness in his voice though. At some moment, while we were having a nice conversation and laughing, Mike's eyes catching a glimpse of one of the girls that worked there. I looked at the woman and was shocked to see the resemblance. She looked exactly like Mike's ex-wife, Beth. From that moment on, Mike would not say a single word. He was just sitting with a mesmerized look on his face, eyes locked on the Hooters girl. Sally, being the most extroverted one of our little group, noticed the situation and to cheer Mike up, asked the girl to come to our table. She came near us and asked if we had any other orders. Sally said that we wanted nothing but her time. Even though she hesitated at first, Sally convinced her to take a seat with us. Mike would not take his eyes off her. Sally asked her name, and she said it was Ellie. At that moment, Mike started to speak again. Does your name come from Elizabeth? She kindly nodded. Mike smiled with his eyes wide open like a maniac. I took it as a behavior that revealed Mike's unhealthy state of mind, but Sally thought it was a genuine smile. Sally kept on talking with Ellie, praising Mike constantly to this woman who just met us. I think she was trying to make Ellie and Mike hook up so that he could feel a bit better about himself. I didn't want to say anything, but I knew that something was off about this situation. After a while, Mike started to act normal again, but he would only reply to Ellie and would not react to the things Sally and I said. As time passed, Ellie would go and take orders from other tables, then come join us again. She seemed like a pretty cool person, and I enjoyed her talk. I was surprised to find out that we actually had a lot of things in common. She was a cat person, like I was. She loved watching soccer, and loved watching romantic comedies. We began to talk about the movies we saw, and I realized that she watched and loved most of the movies I loved. We talked with Ellie for hours, and while I was enjoying her company, I was not aware of the time. It was late, and the restaurant was closing. Ellie said that she would help the others to close the restaurant, and Sally went with her to help as well. When my focus shifted on Mike, I noticed him staring at me with frustration and envy. I asked if everything was all right, but he didn't say anything. I guess that the reason for his anger was because our conversation with Ellie, but I didn't want to believe that. He was expecting me to say something, anything, but I didn't say any words in hopes that he realized how insane his reaction was. I wish I had said something, but I didn't. Mike left the restaurant. He was so angry that he left his coat inside. I went up and helped Ellie. We finished the work in 15 minutes, and Ellie and I continued our conversation. I don't know how the situation led up to that, but we ended up kissing. And Ellie and I continued our conversation. I don't know how the situation led up to that, but we ended up kissing. We're both young, attractive people. I don't blame us for doing it. We stopped kissing out of embarrassment when we heard Sally say, Aw, look at the two lovebirds. Aren't they cute, Mike? With these words, I looked at Mike's face, 
He was looking at us with red eyes. His eyes didn't reveal any anger. It was something else. He had the eyes of a person who had completely lost his sanity. He went to our table, took his coat, came near us. With a fake smile on his face, he said, Are you ready to go home? At that moment, I hoped that his smile was genuine, but I knew it wasn't. We went outside. Mike asked Ellie to drive her home, but she said that her place was near mine, so she decided to come with me. Mike took Sally to his car, and they went away in a hurry. I remember finding it strange that Sally would go with him, as her place was near to where I lived as well, but I figured that she might have been accompanying him to cheer him up a little bit more. When we got close to my house, Ellie asked to come inside, and I said, okay. Ellie spent the night with me. Around 4 a.m. when we were sleeping, I woke up from my sleep upon hearing a loud knocking at the door. As I went up to open the door, I heard the screeching sound of car tires. Who is this? It's 4 a.m. I inquired. No reply. I slowly opened the door. I found a box at my doorstep with crimson liquid leaking out of it. I could feel my heart pounding because of the uncanny sensation I was feeling. I opened the box and I saw the severed head of Sally. Eyes gouged from its sockets, teeth replaced with needles. I immediately woke Ellie and told her what happened. She suggested we should call the police right away, and we did. They arrived rather quickly and searched the house for the surroundings. They could not find anything. They questioned us for a couple hours and left. I suggested Ellie stay with me for her safety, but she insisted on going back to work. She had to earn money and couldn't allow herself to focus on this horrifying incident. I was convinced and let her go. That was the other mistake I made. After a week, I heard on the news that the restaurant was burned down and several people were tied inside of the building. A message was left on the wall of the restaurant that said, Sinners. Ellie was one of the people that was killed and burned to death. Yesterday, I heard the sound of glass breaking. I went downstairs to see a message written on my living room wall. You are next. I took a knife from the kitchen and went outside. I saw that my car's windows were broken and another message was written on the doors that said, you filthy cheater. Police cannot seem to find the person who did this, even though I know it was Mike. Once a dear friend of mine was now my nightmare. Every night, I can hear the sound of heavy breathing coming from the closet that keeps me from sleeping. I don't know how long I can continue living like this, but I'm willing to end it once and for all.